Give me one. And we are possibly almost <laughs> live on YouTube. Welcome, everybody to today's breeder round table spelt incorrectly but it should be r-o-u-n-d table uh with mean gene from mendocino that's me peter severi uh we got a panel of cultivators and breeders who are all growing uh jackson's genetics in what do we have massachusetts uh colorado uh california uh maine right we have a maine, maine. in the house yep Yep. All right. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Jackson is having technical difficulties. He has not yet mastered zoom, but he is trying to get on. Um, so why don't we start? I mean, I'd love to hear you guys talk about me and Gene, like he's kind of legendary and, uh, and why don't you guys talk about his genetics? Brandon, let's start with you. Okay, well, I have I have my own cross. That's a cross between the Black Lime Reserve and Gorilla Glue Four, the Lime Orilla. Um, it's really high terpene variety. Um, it I usually tests uh, around like six and a half percent for total terpenes. Um, I've been hunting. I've been hunting this variety for about five years and I've picked a couple of different uh different phenos that have really really and I, I always I always uh judge all my pheno hunts off of the uh terpene profiles and I get them tested so uh, but I've kept different varieties uh throughout and I actually I didn't when I originally had uh, made this cross I didn't know who the breeders of either of the parents were and it wasn't until like I started going on Instagram and I uh, found out who different who had bred the different varieties and I started tagging the uh the, the original breeders that's how I actually uh kind of got turned on to Mean Gene and we we started talking on uh IG and uh I ended up meeting up with him at the at the cup and I gave him uh <laughs> I think my number 31 cut of the lime Marilla. and then uh, he gave me some seeds and uh i came out to oklahoma from california and i'm you know cultivation director for a organic farm out here and uh i just ran some of the seeds that he gave me the uh, lime one lime one grape soda skunk and they have a uh they have a, a really distinct terpene profile that's very similar to kind of one of the uh, undertones of the terpene profiles from, uh, I apologize, I have a, uh, a macaw that's really loud at times. Um, uh, I have, they have a really uh, interesting terpene profile and it's, 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 it's really hard to describe. I actually have, I actually have a cross of, uh, the limerilla of something else that's really similar to the variety um and they have this like they definitely have a, a lime that cuts through the whole uh profile but this one has like this really musky um like really musky kind of cheesy uh funk to it as well um and it has and, and it's really similar to like the black line that has that real chemical, like it's really hard for me to, 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 to describe, you know, it's cause it's there, the, the profiles are so complex. Um, but you know, I've been do I ran, I ran the, the line one, line one. I found a couple of phenos that I like that I'm keeping. And, uh, I have a bunch of different phenos of the lime Orilla, which is the black lime reserve gorilla glue cross. On, I'm running a bunch of those at my facility. And, you know, I've just, you know, if I, I also have a, a really robust male from the Lime One, Lime One Grape Soda Skunk. I haven't done anything with it yet. I'm not sure if I'm gonna, um, 
I do wanted to do a uh, outcross on my Lima Rilla, um, so I could have male breeding stock because it's all a uh, S1 or it's like a, you know, feminized cross. So it'd be nice to be able to do that. Sorry, hold, hold on. All right. So first of all, uh, Gene <laughs> or Jackson, uh, can let, let's, this is your first time ever on zoom. Uh, he has not yet mastered audio, uh, but at least he's here. Uh, so in the bottom left of your screen, you should see a little microphone. And if you tap on it, but anyway, Brandon, let me, uh, sorry, I'm trying to grab your, uh, here, why, why don't we go, Kyle, let's, uh, let's move to you, uh, while we troubleshoot Gene's audio and I try to show some of the pictures that Brandon sent and then I'll get yours as well. Uh, yeah. so go for it. Cool. You're in Massachusetts, my home yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great place to grow. You know, I, I started, uh, growing some of uh, the lime vine outdoors here. And um, right off the bat, it was just super resistant to all the pests. And uh, I actually didn't see a lick of botrytis on it all season. Um, it, it was just a, a super sturdy, consistent plant. And uh, when I popped those packs originally, I got a few males that just right off the bat, you could smell like a acetone coming off of them. Um, and I used those to, to breed a few things. You know, I got a Dr. Lime times lime vine that uh, it's, it's, fermented fruit for days you know it's it's uh not quite as high as, as brandon's terpenes but it's it gets around three percent um and that that smells great to me you know um i also got some pina that i'm gonna cross with a, a balak afghani that throws about seven to ten percent cbg so i figure that'll be a, a really cool medicinal cross that i can get out there um and uh, other than that, I got some Cherry West BX and some Ghost OG times Sky Jaro outside this year. And they are just loving the uh, damp New England weather. They are uh, super hardy and, and some of the most consistent genetics I've seen out there. All right. So, Gene, your very first words ever, or Jackson, your very first words ever on Zoom. Let's hear them. Ah, I'm we still can. Oh, just just yes. kidding. Just kidding. Man. Yes. Hey. I'm here. I'm on Zoom. <laughs> I had so my uh, at, mic muted at, in the settings. As I said, we'll we'll do it do small. We'll do it slowly. We'll be, we'll be gentle on you. Uh, break me in easy. Right. <laughs> all right. So so why don't all right now now that we have you uh, let because originally I wanted to kind of have you talk about kind of or or actually let let me start with this for everybody else like you've all run his lines what do you think he's about? Like what, what's, what's his lane in terms of, of what he likes as a breeder? That unique palette, you know, exactly. that's okay. here from everybody is just the Terps are different and you know, you, you can't find Terps like them on almost anything. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think it's really <clears throat> the complexity, I think of each terpene profile, like, you know, there's so many elite cuts out there that, uh, or single dimensional, I'd say. And what really appeals to me about Freeborn is, you know, it, it'll hit every note. It'll get the fruity, it'll get the funk. Um, so, I mean, I kind of got addicted to the, the terpene profile. So just all those layers. But... Anyone else? You guys touched touch on the terpene and I would just say breeds for size too. Stuff it's huge outdoor. Oh yeah, love and it seems and, and, like it seems like uh, all the lime uh, vari uh, lime varieties that I've uh, smoked, they all have a really similar type of high, which seems to me to be more uplifting and um, it's not so uh, sedative for myself anyway. In my experience, definitely. I found too, you know, everything is really hardy. Um, you know, all the plants that I grow from Freeborn or, you know, 80 to 90%, um, they just they take off with, you know, they're not always the most vigorous, but they're always pretty vigorous. And 
they just seem to stand up to um, all the environmental factors out here in Colorado. You know, we get high UV and we get pest pressure and tons of sun, not too much water. Um, and they just seem to be really resilient, I would say as well, um, to, you know, all those environmental changes. But I appreciate the work and the lines too, man. Like the stuff that you, even the stuff that you put out on the internet, like to other seed companies, it just, it's, it's not just like a, a chuck and then here you go you can you know you're throwing out fourth generation seeds and you know you can can the consistency in in the line or at least a, a, a bunch of different lines and Gene, what uh, or Jackson, what? Why don't you talk about kind of what your intent is uh, in breeding? Um, I mean, I really um, try to focus on stuff that uh, you know, like th things that are good for me to grow. So, I mean, when I originally started making seeds, um, was kind of a weird transitional period where there was some stuff around back then that was like really, really consistent and pure. And there was a few things like that, but a lot of stuff like you would plant whatever seed it was and you could get like a whole huge spectrum of different um, plants. And um, some of them were good and some of them were bad. And even of the pure stuff, it would have, it would be like really consistent, but then you'd have like, they'd all want to rot and everybody would be like, oh yeah, you got to, you got to cut the tops before it's really done. Or, um, you know, stuff would be, um, really chunky, but not that stony or whatever. So when I first started making stuff, I just always wanted to have like, a, um, a plant that I'd really like to grow and be able to have it from seed where we could do whole gardens of it and, and have it be, um, pretty predictable as far as um, quality and with the vigor and everything on it. Um, so that's really what all my work comes from. And it's, you know, been bred outdoor. And if something likes to rot outdoor, I never really like to keep the seeds from it unless it's really special. And then I'll keep working on it for a while to see if I can find ones that are, uh, that are good and, um, you know, don't rot. So, you know, with heart, like I, you know, I want stuff that I can actually grow and you can have the coolest weed ever and it can be the best smoke and the most killer plant and huge buds. And if you get all the way to the end and it wants to rot on you, then, um, you know, it's pretty much worthless to you really. So just that the hardiness and then, you know, really, um, really good smoke, like basically like stuff that when you finish it out and you, you're done growing it, you're glad that you grew that seed, you know, that's like the only, oh, the only real um, major goal, you know, I just don't want to grow something that I get to the end of and I'm like, oh man, I, sh I shouldn't even given this any space. Um, so just trying to, you know, make stuff that is, is um, good in those ways and then consistent in those ways so that it's pretty reliable. And um, so that's like my real focus. And I, you know, I've grown indoor and I've grown greenhouse, I've grown winter greenhouse. I've done all of it to a certain extent, but I really like growing like outdoor plants that are bigger because it just has a little more character to it as far as like your experience with it. And um, so I kind of focus on that and um, you know, it's gotta be good for that. You gotta be able to grow a real big plant and um, have it be a big heavy plant usually for me to really like stuff, which is kind of weird because now people grow smaller plants and um, sometimes that doesn't translate as well to yield for some of the things. So then you gotta find the ones that are better as a small plant. Some of the stuff I have, it's like the lime stuff. The buds aren't that big. But if you plant a big plant of it, you get this huge yield. But if you grow a small plant of it, you don't get as much because it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't scale down size-wise the same way on the frame. So 
but um but yeah that's my whole my whole uh my whole goal is just some good good um good weed with some character to it good plants all right i'm gonna unmute myself uh so Kyle, you were, I actually just queued up some of your pictures. So why don't we, uh, run through them and then just keep going down the line. Um, so what are we looking at here? That's the, uh, Dr. Who times lime vine. I took that, uh, lime vine mail with that really acetony smell that, that just loved being outdoors in the humid New England, uh, end of summer and, uh, hit it with a homegrown or hit that on homegrown natural wonders, Dr. Who and, um, there's so many great phenos I've been pulling out of this actually just made F2 seeds out of it. And, um, it's just super funky, super fruity. It's got beautiful terpenes on it. And it's, it seems to be very resistant to, to any environmental issues and just really consistent fun plant to grow. Like you were saying. And, and so it looks like you grew it, uh, indoor and outdoor or sorry. Yep. Yeah, I, I try to do them both, you know, just to really see how it's going to react in all the environments. You know, it, it's great being able to do it indoors in, in perfect climate and environmental, but if it can't handle outdoor in, in September in the soggy nights, you know, it's, it's not really worth growing. Got it. And uh, Jackson, what are your thoughts on looking at your babies growing up in Massachusetts? Um there uh i've been watching those for a while those are super cool um odie and uh and uh mushmouth are friends of mine from years back and um they bred a lot of their stuff outdoor in oregon which is even harder than here mm -hmm. so um it's a really kind of a, a match made in heaven i think with two real exotic um mold resistant um good yielding strains you know with crazy terps that's more of like a, as far as I've, I've been told is more of kind of a grapey fruity thing. And then the lime vines more of a citrus cushy thing. Um, but, uh, they look really nice. I, I definitely, um, give them a whirl out here. I think they'd, I think they'd probably do, um, better than most anything out in the weather in the, in the, um, in the harsh climate as far as the humidity and everything just because of the combo and the and the uh environments where both of those things were bred so it's a cool mashup i tagged um odie on uh on uh instagram and i was like hey we did a collab and he was like no i didn't have anything to do and i was like no no they they, they collabed us man it's a forced collab no it's and, a beautiful uh, one the nuts yeah. are super on that every time too you know you're never disappointed with the yield with that cross for sure i'll try to get nice, some stuff out there yeah yeah i try them out it's a kill it's killer work i still have some doctor who and uh quantum kush and a couple other things from them that i've had for years that i've just been i, I pull them out and i almost pop them and then i just wind up <laughs> popping more of my own stuff but i've just had my eye on them for a while so it's cool to see somebody do something with it because it's it's something that um I might have done with it, you know. So it's like one of the I always like to see when people make stuff um with anything that I put out and that, you know, it works. Super cool. I appreciate that, man. All right. And then Brandon, uh, as I'm frantically pulling everyone's pictures and trying to organize them. So th this is uh was this grown in Oklahoma? Yeah, <clears throat> that's the uh, lime one, lime one, grape soda skunk. That's one of the phenos. I did like a, like about a dozen of them. They're all pretty consistent. Um, I had uh, the pheno, uh, the, pheno, the phenotypic expression was pretty even across the board. And then I had uh, one pheno that was uh, a lot more purple. Um, and then it, the, the leaf, the, the leaf morphology wasn't, was different. It was more narrow, um, and all the rest, everything else was really broad leaf dominant. Um, and then I had one, which, uh, I kept in the pheno hunt, uh, which it actually has a, di I didn't, I didn't have a picture of it. It has a, a different, uh, bud structure. It has the same structure as far as the morphology is, is concerned, as far as it's really sh a kind of a short, uh, bushy plant. It's really, really broad, wide leaves. Um, 
but this one has like almost like black flowers um and it has a slightly different uh terpene profile it's it doesn't have so much of the lime as it does like a fruity uh, musk very similar to um uh, like i guess like this kind of skunky musk i guess you could describe it as kind of like that cheesy that like kind of cheesy funk um and but it has some like fruity uh tones in it as well so and then i had a, the other pheno that i kept too was more of like the the lime that i get from like some of the crosses that i've made with the lime orilla and um it's that lime kind of chemical uh like floral uh terpene profile sounds tasty man yeah they're all really good i have you know that's one of the things too is like the i feel like the smoke is more like it, it has more body to it, it has more flavor and like overall like uh, and it almost it really does kind of translate over to you know what you what you get when you're you know breaking up open a nug so i i really like that because i think people really well i look for that as a connoisseur smoker i want to be able to have taste that you know that profile that i'm smelling so just quickly um survivor one time asked what does jackson feed his plants so can you talk about your own kind of setup like you're in mendocino uh kind of is everything for bre i mean you're you're not growing for the market right for i mean like flour to sell into california's amazing regulated market uh so what what's talk about your setup um, so, I mean, I, I used, I used to grow, um, I used to grow really big plants as big as I could get them. And, um, we could do 25 plants here. And so it was like, you know, um, between 100 and 300 gallon pots, depending on what, what I was doing and when. And, um, so I did... I did one year where I was all um, hundred gallons and I had more plants that year and used the same space for, for more plants in smaller pots, which, you know, I think small plants are always more practical, but big plants are really cool to look at and um, just super fun to have. And you feel really good walking around a garden full of monster plants that are just looming over you. You can, stand in the shade of a plant you know it's pretty cool um now i have uh i have you know pretty much like five and seven and ten and fifteen gallon pots um with plants and this year i'm depping stuff because last year the frost was so bad that um I didn't really want to gamble with it. I lost way too much last year to the frost and here that's never happened. And I've made seed for a good 20 years, um, you know, 20 actual seasons I'd say. And I've never, uh, I've never had any, any problem where everything froze. And then last year, everything just froze. And so, and it froze early, like right at the turn of October. I can't remember the exact date, but it was like 18, degrees here or something and people who were on land that wasn't quite as flat as where I'm at because I'm kind of on a little on kind of a shelf I'm not at the bottom of the valley but I'm I'm I'm, um, I'm on flat ground maybe a couple hundred feet up and everybody who was on a little hill or a knoll or something was like oh it was the best fall ever and I was like damn yeah I wish it wouldn't have hit 18 at my house because most of the stuff I have is 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 hardy down to uh you know, in the, in the mid twenties, if it gets, you know, 28, 26 or something, you're probably cool. But anyway, so that made me kind of switch it. So this year I started doing stuff in adapt. So, um, right now I have a big hoop, um, full of a bunch of different cool clones. Um, I have, uh, I have all the stuff that is, is big around here right now, like ice cream cake and, um, uh, runts and 
gelato and all those all those ones that are like the big market favorites right now um and then i have you know uh lime selections and root beer selections and urkel cross lime um what else is in there a bunch of different stuff um and and are these things you want to bring in as part of your library and start playing with and crossing with stuff you have to kind of yeah. So, you know, what I, what I do is I, is I go ahead and try to work my own stuff um, that I've already made to go forward, but I always have to remind myself that at one point I didn't have anything and everything that I wound up with was something cool, you know, um, that somebody else had and was, and, and gave to me. So even though I have these things that are like, have been around and I've worked them and um, like they, you know, I consider them to be like my stuff that's got a lot of uh, energy put into it. Um, at one point, they were just some seeds and clones that I wound up with. So I try not to get too um, tunnel visioned out on my own little um, projects and, you know, thinking nothing else is good. I mean, like a lot of this stuff, people go, oh, that's just hype or whatever. A lot of times if you grow up for a while, you go, damn, this is good. Like this would have been good in the late nineties or this would have been good in the early two thousands or the eighties or whatever. It's just killer. I mean, the ice cream cake clone that's up here right now is just, it's awesome. Like it's just a great plant. So, um, you know, my knee jerk reaction is to go, ah, everybody's growing that. I don't want to do nothing with it. But then I grow the plant and I go, damn, that's really a good plant on its own merit, even if it had no name and it just popped out from somewhere. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm taking those things and then, and then working them in and then, uh, and, uh, just trying to, you know, keep an open mind to try things and, you know, you gotta be, uh, you, you got to have that kind of mindset when you're breeding stuff. You can't just get stuck and go, oh, well, you know, you, you have to judge thing on its own, on its own qualities. So, um, but yeah, I mean, back to, uh, I drifted off just talking about how I do things. So I was talking about the depth and kind of picturing it out there, but um, I do stuff organic. I tend to use, um, I tend to use like dry powders. I'll take pots that I already have full of dirt um that I've grown last season and I'll just leave the dirt in them sometimes and uh and I'll throw in some gypsum and fishbone meal and kelp and trace minerals and glacial rock dust and cascade minerals and um just different stuff to give them what they need and then uh and then um just plant right back in it and I seem to have the same results or better as if I do like real nice super soil mix myself or if I buy dirt in bags or whatever it seems to all kind of come out the same as long as you stay on top of it and I'm not super attached to any particular mix I really I always use glacial rock uh has a lot of iron manganese um I always use kelp uh, over the years I've started to like fishbone meal even though it's really stinky um but it, it's really nice. It's got a lot of nitrogen in it and uh, for a bone meal. Steam bone meal I always used for phosphorus for years. Um, just different things, you know, like they, things might be kind of redundant on what is in them, but different sources. So like I'll use like gypsum. And then um, when I was doing my big pots, I would put in a little bit of dolomite and then maybe like some oyster shell uh you know you want to have a lot of calcium with pretty much everything we're growing and um you know i don't do any soil testing and i'm not really a soil scientist of any kind i just kind of do what has always worked for me and um you know i don't even have like a specific amount i use i just make sure there's a good amount i'll use different amounts and not see that big of a difference i mean i have friends who test their soil and do everything really properly and they might get a little bit better results. Um, but I always get good enough results. When I was growing big plants, I was able to grow big monster plants that if I did them right, you could get 10 pounds off a plant. Um, so I've always just been happy with kind of the old organic soup, 
no pH, not really knowing what's going on except for the results. And I've always had really good results with that. And uh, that's kind of how I do it. And I just make sure to not use anything, um, anything too salty. I stopped using chicken manure years ago because I realized it was a lot saltier than I wanted. Um, but uh, I, I still don't have any problem with it. I just don't use it myself. And then uh, other than other than just, you know, trying to make sure I don't ruin the life in the dirt. Um, alfalfa meal I like a lot. Um, top dressing in the spring. If you have your pots out and you want to do like a low tech no till, you can kind of just toss a bunch of stuff on your pots and put about a foot deep of um, organic alfalfa hay on top. And the worms and everything will just break it down and take it in and um, they'll kind of dig dig everything down into the dirt for you. And you'll wind up with a really good live soil and save your arms and save your back and save some money. And um, I was able to do a really good uh, 200s. I guess by that point I was doing 300 gallons and it, it got to the point where it was a lot of work to mix 300 gallons and I had broken my wrist and I didn't know it was broken at the time. I just knew it hurt. And I was like, just mixing all my own dirt myself. And it got ridiculous. And at a certain point I was like, well, I've been growing these other pots, these 65s and I never dig them. I just top dress them and they do pretty good. So I'm going to try it with the big ones. And so I started doing that with the hay. And uh, after I started doing that, I got the same results, but it seemed like the plants were a little more resilient to everything. Like everything was more in balance. And, um, you know, I was able to have 25, 300 gallon pots. And I think I only probably spent maybe, you know, one or $2,000 on all my amendments to grow those from start to finish. And that was a big change because uh, before that I had been spending at least a few grand to be able to feed those suckers. And, um, so that's, that's kind of where, where I've gone to now is just everything's kind of low tech. I used to use, I, I used to use Dr. Earth for a little bit. Then I started just kind of looking at the ingredients and then mixing my own stuff. And then right now I'm just using like EV stone all purpose because it has a lot of the same stuff that I use. And then I just add some, um, cascade minerals and some glacial rock dust and a little extra gypsum and, um, that's been doing really good, but that's how I do everything. Super bootleg, um, nothing really specific. And it seems to work just about as good as anything that I see going on. Um, so uh, that's now as you, far as how I grow. That's how I grow, you know? I was going to say, you uh, you said most seasons, you know, you amend with generally the same type of stuff and it doesn't come out too different. Do you notice like different, you know, typical expressions if you get someone growing the same plant as you out by the coast or on the East coast or down in Colorado or anything like that? Uh, well, I mean like locally here, there's really some major differences in the microclimates. So um, I've talked about this some other places before, but it's like uh, if you get into more humidity, I noticed that weed gets really stinky and it gets really big, um, big, more fully developed uh, individual features like each, each brack, each little leaf. Um, everything is maybe not quite as dense and heavy, but it, it gets a little bit, um, it seems to be bigger resin. I've never seen, I've never really done any, any, uh, study to see are the heads on the, on the glands actually bigger or what, but it just seems like it. Um, it definitely, they're definitely at least get a little bit taller and more visibly frosty looking. Um, Whereas if you go like over the hill to the east from where I'm at, things start to get really compact and the resin is more close to the flower. Um, and uh, you're producing a lot more biomass, but you're probably losing a little bit of like what I like. Like I'm really, I, I'm used, I grew up seeing different stuff from different areas here. And it's like where I'm at is over the over basically like one range from me is the ocean, but I'm in a place where it's still nice. But then if you go east from me just a couple miles, it becomes really arid 
and there's no more like where I'm at you can grow redwoods but you have to plant them but if you go a little further east it's like really a challenge to be able to plant a redwood which you know they kind of get a lot of their water from humidity in the air and stuff um so like I see a lot of differences with that and uh just the general um structure and morphology of the plants the way they are they want to be they want to be like a dense little hedge bush if you're where it's more dry and hot and then if you go over the hill from me um everything is like a christmas tree and then you top it to make it bushy and you get like a double christmas tree and you top it again and you get like a four topped christmas tree but if you are where i'm at even if you don't top everything, it's totally round. And then if you go a little bit further east, um, farther from the ocean, it just becomes super shrubby. Yeah, if you try to grow a Christmas tree, it just doesn't ever really work. They never get that shape because they just, um, it's so hot and dry. Everything just kind of wants to get that kind of a, make kind of a globe shaped plant. And the same thing happens with the buds, you know, instead of being like that well-defined look where you see the big, the big the big pods everywhere and it's all super frosty and it might be a little more leafy and um and everything then you know you get a little it gets a little bit more arid and all of a sudden you have the stuff that's just like compressing itself as it grows not really but it's just growing like the stems grow slower and everything grows smaller but it definitely produces more biomass you know you get more weed but it's like not the weed that i like to smoke as much but if you were growing it just for extracts and stuff, I would say going to a climate that's hot and dry would make you produce a lot more profit versus if you go near the coast, you're going to get this weed that you're like, wow, I'll, somebody from inland might want to trade their sack in their pocket for the weed front that's more coastal, but they're not going to want to trade, they're not going to want to trade the, the cash they get from their harvest, you know? So it's a kind of that, that trade off. And then, um, that I think kind of translates to, to just general climate. So somebody, even if they're near the coast, but they're in SoCal, they're still, it's still going to be more hot and dry than it would be if you were in inland, um, inland Washington or Canada or something, you know? So um, I think humidity plays a lot and heat plays a lot into it. And um I don't know so much about everything else, but that's definitely a thing when people talk about terroir and um, different areas and all that, like it, weed from one place is weed from that place. Like Hawaiian weed is distinctly Hawaiian and lowland Hawaiian versus upcountry Hawaiian is really different than each other too, you know? So um, the environment you grow it in has a big um, impact and, that translates to indoor growing too. Like um, if you grow indoor weed on the coast here, you'd think, well, you're, cre you're creating the environment, but unless you have a sealed room um, where you're taking out a lot of the humidity, if you're, if you're intaking any air from outside and you're near the coast, you're going to have, you'll have good weed and it'll be a lot easier to pull than if you're growing it outdoor when it might mold, but it's still going to have that look of something that's more coastal and it's going to have like just you know super thick white frost everywhere but it's going to be more leafy and less heavy you know and that seems to be um something that translates so you know if you um with the right strains you, you know one strain might do better one place than it does in another if i grow diesel here it might be a little bit um less dense than i want it but then if you grow diesel a little further east then maybe you go oh no it chunks up fine and the people think you're tripping or you use too much nitrogen or something you know i was going to say the, the lime vine i got going outdoors compared to when it's indoors when, when i make rosin out of the outdoors it just it's so liquidy it's just terps on terps it doesn't really ever solidify you know yeah. the stuff just waxes up um you know it, it's really it's crazy how different it is just by a little bit of environmental change you know yeah it's a trip and that uh that the a lot of the stuff from the lime it is um a lot of the stuff that i have just because for years i always kind of bred stuff on how good it smoked in a joint and a lot of times the really greasy stuff smokes great in a joint and then um 
you know, I would make, I would make hash from stuff, but never like on a commercial level. So if I got some dank hash on it, I would be like, Oh, it's, it makes really good hash. But if you go to actually produce like hash on a commercial level with some of the stuff I have, that's so good in a joint, it's just too greasy. Like you said, it just doesn't, you know, it, it's really hard. And then if you do grow it indoor, a lot of times indoor, especially like some of the best, craziest looking indoor you see, and you go, Oh God, that looks, that looks like the best weed I've ever seen. And then you go to break it up and you're just like, where's the grease? Like, where's the oils? You know, it's definitely seems to be a, um, a trick to get your weed greasy indoor. And I don't know if that's because, you know, it could be affected by the, um, the humidity for sure. And there might be ways to tweak that, but, um, you know, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't have any data for it really, but it seems yeah, to be a thing. Just bro science in my head, but I assume, you know, the outdoors is trying to put on more terpenes to defend itself from the insects and stuff like that. So it tends and to get- And would, would, would this be what you're talking about? Yeah, that's, that's one of the lime vines. That's uh, one of the females I used to make some crosses. Just loved it out there. Didn't care what the weather was, how much water she had ripped right open <clears throat> yeah so uh my buddy from trinity who's on here he has some experience um growing the lime vine um actually like right next to the ocean and uh yeah i don't know it's crazy you know i think uh i think the soil biology has a huge uh th- is a huge factor in you know the uh, secondary metabolite production of the plants because uh, if we're if we are talking about, about terroir in in an aspect of uh, climate climate condition, you get a lot of regions like for instance where I'm at. Even though it gets really really hot out here, it's humid and in the morning you can see there's always moisture on all of the plants. So that uh, that little ecosystem that's allowing water to always be present can help the soil biology. It can help because hydrology plays a huge role in uh, being able uh, to have those, those soil microorganisms reproduce. And I know that if you're in an area that is a little more humid, you're going to have usually more moist soil and that soil is usually going to be able to produce uh, more biological activity because of it, as opposed to a place where it's real arid. Plus, um, you know, if you have places too where you where you might get cloud cover, um, that that can affect too. That way, you know, I noticed that plants that get a little less direct sunlight oftentimes produce. Uh, higher terpene concentrations as well for sure yeah um we used to notice um back in the old days in the 90s we would always be like damn the shade weed because back then it was like everything was grown in some cover but every once in a while someone would have you know a place that was less than ideal and really didn't get enough sun at all the weed would be super leafy, but it would always be so stinky, you know? And then, um, you know, I kind of have a, I have a feeling that if you're in an area where it's super, super gnarly sunny, you might get better weed if you have a, if you have a 10% shade cloth or something like that, you know, for that reason, yeah. I think. Yeah. You know, probably because a lot of those terpenes are volatile in higher temperatures. And so as those things are producing them, they're also volatizing off of the plant as opposed to, you know, the plant being able to retain more, more of those chemical compounds. Yeah. Those sure. monocots are gone. Yep. They're jumping out as soon as, it, as soon as you're getting into the eighties, you're probably starting to lose a lot of terps. The best indoors that I've ever seen um, are always, you know, they're always, it's always like 75 degrees or 78 tops. And that seems to be like where you really, really get good weed. And then people whose grows get hotter, it's like the weed smoked before it's ever cut, you know? Uh, I know for, cause I do all indoor, but I do, uh, I do uh, like low till system where, you know, I keep, I use crop cover and I do amendments. Really, a lot of the same stuff that 
uh, Jackson's using the, the gypsum, langbanite. I use some amino acid soy hydrolysate fertilizers. Uh, I used to, and then I had to always inoculate with the probiotics and like uh, uh, the Bokashi because I think that helps increase the soil biology as well. And I know that when I have a higher humidity, which I like to run my rooms pretty humid, and that actually really, really increases the, uh, the bioactivity of the biostimulants that I'm using in the soil. Because you can see the mycelium mats developing uh, and staying for a longer period of time in those higher humidity can, uh, uh, environments. So, and, and you know, and we're trying to cycle all that stuff in and make all those things bioavailable to the plant. So if we have that biology sticking around for a longer time, you know, and it has something to feed on, essentially we can keep that going and we can get as much into the soil as that plant is, is utilizing. Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a thing going on with the soil where, you know, if you're growing in straight cocoa or rock wool or whatever it is, it's like you're putting stuff in and then it's coming back out. But that's why I've always liked, um, just organic soil because you put all this stuff on there and when I do like a super soil uh, style uh, it's kind of the same as when it's like the 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 low-tech no-till that I was doing too you put everything on there and it sits and all of that all of that microbiology going on in there it's all breaking things down and tying them together and making it all stick around so that when you water your soil um the water's not just pushing everything right out everything is stuck in there but it's also being released by that same by that same life that's in your soil you know um so you know it's definitely i i i think that by doing that um there's more of the these trippy things that become available to the plant that help it to be able to turn it into these different terpenes that you might not get because I've seen really cool clones that I have grown by salt growers who have really gnarly custom salts that will like increase the THC in crazy ways and give them crazy yields, make the plants finish faster, heavier in all aspects, everything is improved except that when you smell the weed, even though it's still good weed, it ha it's lacking all these things that I smell when it's either grown organically inside or when it's grown organically outside. And some things outside, they become plain when you grow them outdoor, or even if you're outdoor in a different place, they become plain smelling. And then other things, when you put them indoor, they become plain and, um, you know, it's really trippy, all the little subtleties going on. It's, you know, sure, eventually people will figure out exactly what it is and pin it down. But, um, you know, as far as right now, it just seems like a lot of times live soil in the sun and the outdoor environment, you just get a lot of crazy terpene content. You know? I, I, you know, what? I think it, it might be due to the fact that you, uh, all of these microorganisms, all these bacteria, the fungi, the archaea, they're, they're also producing secondary metabolites. And some of these are organic acids, you know, these things are uh, uh, different vitamins, amino acids, enzymes. And I think the plant, in, you can't get those in, in salts. You know, you can only get those things through through the biology. And if the plant is essentially getting those things through the biology, uh, I think that is what's is, is probably has, has, is causing a lot of genetic changes in the plant. Cause we know there are like signaling molecules that change, you know, systemic acquired resistance, for instance, right? And that could be something where it changes the plant internally because of something that a, a bacteria is producing and it's telling the plant, okay, I need to change this to internally fight off this compound and that might affect the way that it produces its own secondary metabolites. I think uh, there's a lot of stuff that's happening with uh, the biology and the soil and endophatic uh, microorganisms, bacteria that can go in and out of the plant as well as fungi that are, you know, we know for instance, we, the endo and ectomycorrhizal fungi, they have 
the sim, uh, symbiotic relationships. And I think those things are playing a huge role in the expressions for the, for the terpene profiles and also the cannabinoid profiles. Yeah, for sure. And I think like recently, I mean, not that recently, but fairly recently, especially in the, in the ter in terms of history, um, people are starting to realize that, um, you know, starting to look at like the microbiome of everything and realizing like, okay, um, like as people, they say there's only so much of us that actually is really human. And that can come in the form of things that are, um, that are separate from us as far as like, okay, everyone has certain bacteria and all this different stuff on probiotics in your gut and all this different digestive stuff and things that, that are there that, you know, we pick up and are beneficial. But then there's also a lot of our DNA, it turns out, is likely to have come. And I think the plant in, in plants too, you know, the DNA, um, we get these things and they attach themselves and then we wind up with these remnants of things too. And uh, so all, all of the, all of the different things in, in genetics, they all get triggered and can be turned on and off and restricted and, and uh, you know, enhanced. And um, I think, you know, when you have more microbiology and you have more trippy um inputs like you're saying like you know they this thing you know is exuding this and this is doing this and you're getting these new combinations of molecules and everything um i think uh i think that can you know it can probably take your um plant's ability to produce you know it, maybe it can produce 20 terpenes and then all of a sudden these other things are present and all of a sudden it's producing a lot more of those things and maybe producing some new ones. And, you know, it's really trippy. I think humans is probably the same thing is going on for us. Like if we have the ability to eat really varied diets and, um, and, and go to a lot of places and get a lot, pick up a lot of different uh, microbiology on us too. It's probably really, um, it's probably really good. They're, they're talking about with the, with the uh, whole Corona virus that, it seems that a lot of people who are impacted the worst, they have, um, they, they don't have the best gut flora. Um, and I'd imagine that if you're growing plants in a sterile culture, you know, that, um, you know, they probably don't have abilities to, to accomplish certain things their genetics are set up for too, you know, it's a trip. Sounds a lot like the hollow biome uh, kind of theory that's going on. I know Cinch Angel on Instagram uh, references that a lot, but it, it's basically the, you know that idea that um, you know the microbiome is far from unique to humans, and you know plants are <clears throat> literally a part of their environment. You know, I mean, the roots are yeah. digging into the soil, getting exposed to fungi and, and bacteria, and basically living the same way. Um, so I, I'm sure that you guys are onto something there, and we'll be uh, finding out, you know, exactly how all that is impacting our terpenes and cannabinoids. Um, but I'm actually going to have to get going here, guys. Uh, these are kind of my last moments here on my lunch break. So um, I appreciate having me on, and uh, I'm going to bow out. So thanks. All right, James. Thanks for joining us. Come back soon. Um, just quickly, I wanted to uh, keep going down the line a little bit. I had, uh, I guess, uh, Dan, that's you, right? Whoops. Unmute. Did yeah, I unmute can, myself? Yeah, you are. <laughs> can you see that? Yeah. There so what, what, are you, what are you running here? Uh, that's the Sky Cuddler. And that, I believe, is... That is the sky color double. <laughs> um, that's the double as well, I think. I can't see. Got it. The, the ones with the purple expressions are the double. And the uh, first picture was just the sky cuddler. Got it. And what are you noticing about... Uh how that you want to talk about how this stuff grows in trinity county um I'm, I'm sorry what was that 
I said, you want to, you, you want to talk about how this stuff's growing in Trinity County? I'm actually in Maine. Uh, oh, Midco, right, right. Maine. Who, sorry. Who, 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 who is in, who's in Trinity? Wait, was that, uh, I think that's who we just lost, but, uh, all right. So yeah, let's talk Maine. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's grown phenomenal right now. Um, we've just run it, um, in a climate control greenhouse. So we haven't done a full season outdoor run. Um, we did about, I guess somewhere around 30 seeds of the sky cuddler double and about 20 of the sky cuddler. And we found <clears throat> that there was, I like, again, what I was saying just about consistency. I mean, it was a, F, a fourth generation, I think F4. And they were just like <laughs> almost all the same. Um, we had one really cool pheno that was uh, um, uh, the, the black Afghan kind of leaner and um, just think just a really cool plant um, super sour terps gassy um, easy to eat really easy to grow um, you know we did living soil we also ran it in cocoa <clears throat> and it kind of goes to what you guys were just talking about I mean it's kind of funny because the cocoa this thing put on you know arm size buds and even in living soil it did really well as far as yield but the soil just the the terpene content was just so complex um you know you get that sour in each but with the with the living soil um you just get like all these little nuances and stuff um uh we're we're uh we ran a root beer cross i believe that was root beer with the um source genetics they they did a sort of collaboration with their land race tie um and but you know we've been really just working with the sky cuddler lines here the last couple runs and um yeah i i just i mean they're they're my, my favorite plants in the garden um i i can't wait to actually you know, next year run them outdoors. We just really just been working them, trying to, you know, hunt through something, kind of just found the uh, the black Afghan leaner um, that is really like compact, big yielder, um, you know, super high calyx to leaf ratio, very like sour diesel OG, you know, um, like sharp, sour with this real like hashy notes um actually just got a chance to try it today um smoked it and it's just like you know there's kind of like no ceiling it's like really hashy strain man like it's like not for the faint of heart uh which i enjoy a lot um it's it kind of is like smoking just straight hash <laughs> it's pretty wild um, and, and just quickly before I lose it in the chat, CBC Squirrel asked, uh, "Did Dan start from seed or clones every time?" Or so this whole run was all seed. Um, we we just are revegging um, that now. So I'm, our next runs will be from clone. Um, we, we do have a bunch of other seeds going, but I, I haven't flowered those out of the Jeru crosses and a pina, but I, I haven't flowered any of that yet. So I, I, I can't speak on, um, you know, that too much, but the, uh, all the sky cuddler and the double sky cuddler double was all from seed. I think we had a hundred percent propagation rate. Um, yeah, pretty pretty good uh pretty easy to grow when when that happens um stretchy nice stretch on <clears throat> everything um uh and again like just the 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 consistency on the sky cuddler doubles was like i mean in veg it was kind of weird seeing all these plants from seed and being like did i are these clones did i take clones or did i start these from seed because they all look the same um which you know i think speaks to 
the talent of a anybody who's you know breeding genetics that can get their fourth generation to do that i mean i think that's pretty hard to do so um it's pretty cool when you're you know buying a pack of seeds and like hoping that that happens and then like it happens and then you get you know we got one really cool expression on it too so thanks thanks jackson <laughs> uh, but um yeah no I, uh, I i really love it man especially if you like sours like that sour terpene profile or that og you know that kind of like gassy um you know like that gassy like strong racy smoke too um yeah so and G gabriel did, did you send me pictures or no well i just unmuted or yeah there you go yeah i sent you the pictures of the uh lion vines uh what what's what's your email uh the trinity valley organics we're the one that's up in trinity oh you're the one in, all right there we go all right i was like did we lose them all right so so why don't you uh because you haven't talked yet right no okay so let let's talk about uh growing in trinity county because the weed is quite good from there right yeah i mean we're pretty close to gene i grew up in the same area as him so obviously it likes our climate a lot it's real similar to where he's at it, a little more dry up here in trinity but uh you know stuff gets huge and loves it and then uh, like you were saying we grew that lime vine we took it a couple hundred feet from the ocean and grew it there and it uh you know it was very mold resilient it uh out of anything it actually didn't show any mold all the other plants kind of molded out we didn't get much and that we pretty much got every bud off the plant And look at that. Yeah, so this is our selection of the lime vine. It just, all of them are pretty consistent, got really big. This one maybe didn't get quite as big, but it had more of like a purple expression where the other ones didn't. And it's a real, you know, it's a head high. It's real racy, make your heart race. But we do it all like no-till, just the same kind of way he's talking about no-till organic. He actually was the first one to kind of turn me on to growing no-till. Told me like, hey, guys are doing it and they're killing it, getting the same results without the work, you know? So we kind of just gone that same way. We just no-till, all organic. So let, let's talk about, I mean, uh, kind of for me, one of the ideas here was a bunch of different people and a bunch of different geographies and a, with a, well, a lot of similar grow styles, but some different. I mean, we have a little bit of cocoa, uh, a lot of living soil, but uh, when each of you is talking about it or other people, like that's exactly how it expressed itself for me or it's expressing itself slightly differently for me or... Well, Kyle, yeah, I mean, I mean, it works great for us, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, <laughs> we've tilled, no tilled, and it kind of get the same results. Yeah, and I was going to say my lime vine came out really close to uh, Gabriel's, the, the greener pheno, the less purple expression, it, it almost looks identical. So you're yeah, looking at like a twin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in uh, Marlboro, Mass, so it's, it's probably an, an hour and 20 minutes from the ocean on the East Coast, so it's not too far. And Gene, or let me see, or you're you're uh, not muted. Uh, I mean, ha have you talked to different people who are growing, you know, your lines in different places? And is it fairly consistent? Or are there differences that you're seeing? Um, I mean, uh, there's there's always there's always differences um, for people depending, I mean, like I, sometimes I have differences in my own, my own thing. Like if I dry something out a little bit, everything will yellow up, the buds will get harder. So it's really hard. It's really hard to tell, um, completely what's environmental, but, um, I, I'm lucky here that we get the bad weather as far as for breeding. I mean, it's not the greatest for production, but 
for breeding, it's kind of nice because if something finishes out here nice, um, it usually does good um, other places. I mean, I was impressed at how well that stuff did in Maine um, for these guys. And then, um, you know, uh, Trinity is more mountainous. It's definitely, um, it's close to here, but it's definitely a more gnarly place as far as I can tell. I mean, I've only grown out there once, but um, it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's fairly different. And then, um, you know, I've had people grow stuff everywhere. I mean, I had a buddy do a lot of stuff in Thailand and uh, there were some things that worked and some that didn't. And the things that didn't work were the things that were harder to grow here, you know, and that he was growing it in the jungle in Thailand. Um, and then uh, people grow a lot of my stuff in Hawaii and in Hawaii, um, Hawaiian weed's probably about my favorite expression of how stuff comes out. Hawaii is just really something about the way the air is there. And I don't know, maybe because it's a little further south and day length. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely um, stuff does great in Hawaii. But I mean, it holds up in Hawaii, too. And places like Thailand and Hawaii, if you grow something and it's not um, hardy, it just all goes to shit you know and uh but yeah i mean I, i'm thinking wisconsin oregon washington uh canada thailand uh india you know the more exotic places it's only you know one or two people from those kind of places but people grow stuff that i breed here all over and it always comes out different, but it's always trippy because you never look at it and go, whoa, that really tripped out. It just, you look at it, it's like, oh, it's, it's good bud, you know, just a little bit different. But something like from Australia doesn't look, um, doesn't look any more crazy than something from like Ojai and SoCal um, or, um, you know, something in Washington doesn't look that different than something in Humboldt. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's definitely differences, but it's really trippy to see everything's still real recognizable and, um, you know, people get different results, but it seems to, seems to work. People, the most tr trouble I've seen people have with my stuff is when they are like salt growers and they run at, at really high rates of feeding, um, and then stuff freaks out and it's unhappy. And that's because um, my stuff's all bred to be done kind of minimally. And it's not, and I, I'm not the one who like decided to go in that direction. It was just that everything from around here is kind of um, from a gorilla background and people didn't have a lot of food and water to put on stuff. Even if they could afford the food, you still have to, backpack it in and everything so um people tended to select for years around here the stuff that was that would do well on a more minimal program whereas when i get seeds from like amsterdam they're bred in like a more of a big horticulture setting like all borderline agriculture setting and so um you know, I noticed that I, I'll try something here and it'll be like, whoa, like every thrip in the whole county will show up on your one pack of Amsterdam seeds and all my stuff just looks great. And then, you know, it goes yellow first and, um, you know, it doesn't finish as well in the weather, which, you know, um, probably is more from being more from indoor versus their, their big greenhouse operations they had back in the day there. but. Um, yeah, it's, it's trippy, trippy to see um, how finicky things can be when they weren't selected um, for years by people where it really counted um, that they could, you know, they could handle it. But, um, you know, that's the, the biggest, uh, the biggest differences I see. It seems like you can almost see them. Um, from place to place in small distances like it's you go all the way to Maine and I'm like oh that's sky cuddler that looks killer you know 
And then you go and then you have something in SoCal and you're like, well, that looks crazy. And then I see the stuff from Australia and I'm like, yeah, it looks like the stuff from SoCal, you know? So um, there's a guy, um, baked beans, baking in the sun on IG. And uh, he has buddies who pick him up stuff up here from me um, for seeds and he grows a lot of different stuff down there. So I get feedback on that from Australia. And it's really, it's really a trip. I, I still haven't seen anything from Australia that's that, you know, like you think maybe it'll look a little bit more tripped out or sativa-ish or bolty or, you know, more crazy dense or whatever it is. But it just, it just kind of looks, you know, just looks like some good weed, you know, it's cool. Right. Um, with, with your kind of your breeding, you know, if you, your program, can you talk about like, for example, when, when you're doing a pheno hunt, like how many seeds do you want to run? And like, what, what, can you talk about your program? Like I'm like, for example, right now, you just mentioned a lot of the, the hype strains you're bringing in and playing around with. So like when you're crossing things and exploring kind of what's the scope of those projects? Um, what I like to do usually is I'll make some seeds and then I'll try, I'll just try planting a few of the seeds. Like maybe I'll only plant 10 or 15 of something. Um, and I've literally even planted 10 seeds, um, especially like sometimes if they're other people's seeds and I haven't seen them before, but I have access to a lot of them. I'll just take 10 seeds and plant them all in one seven gallon pot. And as soon as they get like a foot tall, I'll lean them apart from each other and yank out the males and then just let them bud. And then if there's anything really exceptional, then I know that it's, it's worth growing 40 or a hundred or however many, um, ideally, to look through stuff you really want it to be in the hundreds but um that's hard to do it that way um so a lot of times a more realistic thing for me will be like 40 or 80 plants of something hoping to get like 50 females to look at and you know or 20 or 30 females and that's enough to let you know um what's available in the gene pool you you might not find anything as crazy as you'll find if you can plant a couple hundred of them but it'll at least tell you if it's worth it because every time you're growing out those plants it's a lot um sometimes i'll also like right now it's july i could plant plants right now from seed and treat them really good and put them in a 15 or 25 gallon pot. And you might still be able to get a pound or two off of a seedling right now, which I didn't used to think is possible, but you can do it. But you can also take those same seedlings, plant them now or even in a week or two and leave them in a five inch pot or a one gallon pot or a three gallon pot. And, you know, the smaller the pot you can leave stuff in, the more plants you can look through. And if you find something really cool, you can always re-veg it. And um, so I've been, over the years, I've got into that. And in a lot of cases, you'll be happy that you didn't put everything in 10-gallon pots or um, even 7-gallon pots because you go through them all and you go, well, it was cool. I'm sure this would be something someone would really like, but it's not anything I want to do anything with. And you can find out just by seeing, you know, a good little quarter ounce of, of, of every different plant, you know, you just know, cause you're like, well, it's not, it's not outperforming these other ones that I have next to it really in any way. And you have to be able to um, focus a certain amount on the things you really want to do. So you can't just, you can't just jump on everything smoking and, and, and um, grow everything and try to turn it into a project. You really have to find the ones that you, that you um, have the most faith in uh, being able to um, take you to the next level in your garden or for you to be able to take it to the next level. Sometimes you, sometimes you plant some seeds and 
there's only some of them that are really good, but they're so much better than all the rest of the things in the same cross that you're like, okay, this is worth doing because I need to get rid of these. And if I can make them all be like these winners, then um, it'll be something that was worth the time, you know? And sometimes you plan a bunch of stuff and they're all really consistent but none of them are up to what you would want anyway. So there's really not a lot of room for improvement there without um, outcrossing it to something else. And if you're not really in love with it, then that's even more work when you're gonna start, you know, making new hybrids with it because you're gonna get, what you did like is gonna get less and less frequent. And, um, you know, it's all, it's all a trip. And I, you know, the being able to focus is one of the biggest things. And it's like the most challenging thing for me is always just like telling myself, like, dude, you need to be able to pick which things to go with. Cause every time you pick something, it's a whole run. And if you're um, breeding outside or you're breeding in the debt or you're breeding in a winter greenhouse or whatever you're doing, it's all that time put in. And then if you didn't go with what was the best bet for you at the moment then you know by the time you're done you're like damn i could have grown these other things you know because there's so many kinds of seeds there's a lot of different a lot of different ways you can go so i just try to go with what um is already what i know is already pretty consistent on quality and then try to make slight improvements that's my um that's really the meat and potatoes of my my um breeding goals as opposed to you know, trying to, um, you know, find something that's going to be the craziest by looking through. I, I have like all these seeds and a lot of times I go, okay, well, if I do a thousand plants right now, um, I can take this land race and that land race and I can, I might find something new and I can make something completely novel and it's really tempting to do. But at the same time I go, yeah, but you're going to miss this whole run when you could have just improved a couple things that you already know are you already want to stuff your garden with, you know, so it's all a trick. Hey, did you, uh, did you, uh, do you still have that lime Marilla that I gave you? I do. I never cloned it. I assumed that you still have it. And so I'm going to hit it with something right now. It's about, it's almost, uh, three weeks into flower right now, I think. So I was going to go ahead and cross it back with the lime again. And, see if it stays limey and keeps some of that gorilla frost it looks killer right now in flower nice so, yeah yeah it's a really that's a really really turpy uh turpy pheno that i had found in the uh, second hunt that i did and uh i was really really impressed by the terpene profile on that it smells was, great it's all lime it's it's very much lime but it has the resin looking more like a gorilla so that's yeah it'll cool. be if it's only three weeks into it'll develop as it as it goes along it's it, it gets pretty complex the profile it has like it develops kind of like a floral uh chemical lime uh and then it has kind of this like uh almost like a soft fabric softener like uh undertone to it it's it's weird it's it's the really it's really complex though nice yeah, those are in the lime. That was always my favorite ones were the ones that were that were really crazy where they have the combination of the chemical and the, the and the citrus and then the kind of like indescribable stuff. Some of them are really woody. Um, and uh, and then some of them are have a lot of the floral. Some of them have like some of them smell like like a like a fucking urinal cake, you know, like they just like that weird, crazy, uh, disinfectant kind of, um, cleaner smell, but then it's mixed with all this other stuff. Some of them are more like really heavy on the eucalyptus and like almost like peppermint. Really cool. There's a lot of weird stuff in there, but yeah, I always like the ones that you're talking about that are a little more floral and, uh, and, uh, I've always liked weed that's really floral like that. It's funny. Some people hate that. They're like, no, all gas. And I'm like, gas is cool, but it was kind of more normal to me when I was young. Things that were skunky and what they call gassy now, just like that killer rank weed buds. That's just weed. That's what weed smells like to me as far as from when I was growing up. So the first times I smelled things that were like really floral and candy and 
those were like those were like the exotic new different stuff to me and it nostalgia plays so much into what i like that it's always hard for me to um to knock the um the stuff that first had the impact on me that made me uh that really seemed different you know it still seems different to me now you know 30 years later 20 years so, later. so can you go back in time and talk about did, did you grow up in mendocino yeah so can, can you talk about, I mean, going from kind of like uh, <laughs> just plain old weed that we all smoked uh, when we were young to like, what were some of the first genetics that you were just like, what is this? And was it coming from Mendocino? Was it coming from elsewhere? Um, so when I was young, I didn't really see weed from elsewhere. I think maybe in the mid nineties when we used to go to reggae on the river. Um, we'd go to reggae on the river and we would just camp and party and we would, um, walk around and a lot of my buddies would do like the trade up where you would basically, um, uh, go around and you might start with maybe, um, you might start with a sack of weed and then you trade some of the weed for some other weed and then you trade some of that weed for some shrooms and then you trade the shrooms to somebody for way more weed and then you trade that for some acid and then you trade that for way more weed and then pretty soon people are like yeah dude i showed up with my with my one little ziploc in my pocket of weed and now dude look i got this i got these shrooms and i got this sid and i got this and the people would like keep upgrading and so that was like some of the only times that i really saw weed from other places because back then it wasn't really a social thing we would get to see people will show you your weed their weed when you already have a big bag of shrooms in front of them you know but back then it wasn't like there was no um there was no real way um to really see anybody's weed except kind of in that context or if it was local stuff so those were kind of the only times like sometimes somebody would come from like santa cruz i remember still now I remember this dude with a backpack and pe you'd walk by and people would be like doses, kind buds, whatever nuggets, you know, and we'd be like, Hey, I'm probably not going to buy any, but can I check it out? And some people would let you check it out. And I remember this one dude from Santa Cruz pulled out his bag and he had like a pound or two in there. And I remember the weed was just so hardcore looking like it was just so it had no leaf and it was so frosty and just dank and it was way different than anything we'd seen and it was you know it was from a different area it was totally different genetics and um it was bomb the closest thing that i can remember seeing to that was this stuff called golden lion which came from island mountain back like around 90 nine around 90 maybe a little bit later so some of the first weed i ever saw with a name probably golden lion uh northern lights as far as weed with names like usually weed didn't have names back then and honestly usually weed wasn't even in its own bag um by itself so like if somebody had a pound of weed you could go through the pound of weed and find a few grams of something that was really really gnarly among a bunch of weed that was you know just some weed and it didn't really matter back then nobody really had their weed completely separate unless they grew indoor from clone and they only had one thing so naturally it was separate or um if they only had a little bit of weed but like people who were really growing weed you cut down all the weed you hang it all up and then it gets all trimmed up and people weren't keeping it separate because it didn't matter. It all sold and smoked the same. People were just stoked to have weed back then. Um, so the whole name thing, there wasn't even really a whole lot of point to it. But coming into around 94, 95, like when I started actually growing weed and my friends were all growing weed, um, then we started, you know, my buddies would have some really exotic stuff and it would usually have the name of who they got it from. My buddy, one of my favorite ones that he had, uh, my buddy, um, OG Foundation Farms on uh, Instagram. He had this one from this lady named Madeline. And uh, 
and Madeline's passed now, but she had this strain that I don't know what it was, if it was hash plant or some cool Afghani or what it was, but it was just really gnarly weed. It was kind of similar to like what people call the puck or um, like, um, like kind of like a chem 91 look, but it always had different kind of flavors, but it always smoked really good and it would really knock you on your ass. And that was killer. And we had a, um, we had a buddy that we called Grimp and um, uh, Grimp used to get weed from his dad. And it was purple weed that would, when you popped a film canister of it, like back then, if you had weed, it was probably in a film canister. He used to keep his weed in vitamin jars a lot. Um, and uh, you, if you, if someone popped that in the car when you were driving down the road, you, you would just think that you had gone past a skunk. And then when you smelled the weed up close, it had like a pine sap smell to it. And it was, um, some of it was all the way purple, always with really pretty white resin. Um, and some of it was like purple on the very inside, but green on the outside. And we call it the 50, 50 grapes, but we called it Grimp's grapes. And that was like one of those weeds, um, that was just like, you know, when, when some, when he had some, you'd be like, Oh dude, can I get a little bud? You know, and we were like 15 or something. And, um, super killer was always grown. Um, his dad only used, uh, chicken manure and lime in his dirt. And he grew in like 25 gallon pots underneath tan oak trees that were hollowed out. And it would just always be the most smokable weed. Like to this day, like the closest thing to it is probably like some of my cherry pie crosses, like cherry limeade or something. It has a, a skunk and a pine and it had like a grapiness to it that was kind of uh, understated. And we, we mostly called it grapes because it was purple, not because it smelled grapey, but it did have a little bit of like an exotic fruitiness to it. That was like one of the real epic ones. And then, uh, and then um, I'm trying to think of some other ones, you know, there was some really cool stuff that uh, it turns out, it looks like probably came through from like, uh, from like Brotherhood of Eternal Love. We didn't ever know because our, our uh, you know, the older, the older guys didn't ever tell us, but my, my um, buddy was talking to, uh, one of his um, dad's friends and he was like, oh yeah, you didn't know so-and-so? That's what they used to do back there. They were making they were making sunshine back there and that was those first indica seeds. And then those seeds they wound up taking to, taking to Mexico and the tire of a car. And then the Mexican weed price went up that next year because all of a sudden they had the indica and they were giving the seeds to people and then buying the weed back from them. And they promised if they grew it, that they would buy it. I can't remember what it was like. They like we promised we'll pay you fifteen hundred or something, and weed was only worth eight hundred before that or something. And um, in the hills up here, and then uh, you know, like um, that stuff is stuff that's in some things like my grape soda skunk and the pina, like the purple stem stuff. And um, it's like it's cool. Some of the stories wind up like the stories develop. People don't tell fourteen year old kids that people are batching up acid in the back of the valley and then now you're almost 40 and you're talking to a dude who's you know basically like on his deathbed almost and he's telling you oh yeah no no yeah this is the history of this and that and you're like wow so there was there was some heavy duty stuff going on that we never knew about you know but um there was that kind of stuff of those old original afghanis and then you know there was the northern lights um, we got the Northern Lights when I was a kid in 89. And um, that was to me, like, that was like my household weed. It was really, really strong, like ridiculously strong, like strong, like an OG or something. Um, just regular green bud, not a real loud smell to it. it smelled kind of like juicy fruit gum and pine sap when you grew it outdoors. Indoors, it just smelled like indoor keefy weed. It wasn't real exotic or anything but it was so damn potent and the hash from it was just crazy it was the only weed that i can remember where you could put a bong hit in the bong and right when the lighter right when the flame was about to hit the weed you could see the resin on it beat up and melt you know 
And I still haven't really seen that with any weed. I'm sure there's something like that, but um, that was the only one that I ever really remember doing that. And uh, that was used in, you know, in black lime. It's also in the grape soda skunk. Um, and then um, I'm just trying to think like other stuff, like anything with names. There wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of named stuff. There was some cool old Indicas that I saw in the mid nineties that I wound up doing some stuff with big blue, um, big red that's in the sky cuddler. Um, those ones were from like up on, uh, Bell Springs or Spy Rock. They're like old gnarly original, like deep chunk type plants. Um, and uh, yeah, in the 90s, I mean, most stuff was just like, you know, there was the stuff that our buddy, that our buddy Jedi had, it was this crazy purple, it got these huge spears that were like, giant, these giant buds, like the, the, the cola, like would be, you know, the uh, along the whole bottom of, of, of like, a, um, of a Ziploc, and it would just be like this, boom, like yeah, a big bud, like, like that yeah and it would just be the, the whole weed we'd ask him we'd be like hey is your perp done yet and he'd be like no it's still getting purple and we'd be like dude it's like mid-november like isn't it gonna <laughs> rot and he's like no it's just we leave it out and it gets all the way purple and um it was really kind of like a a little bit of fruit with almost like a black peppery thing to it and um just real special and unique i've never seen anything like it since and that was like that's we just called that you know just jed's purple it was just um it was just you know back then we you didn't really know what things were that much so it was like okay there's gramps purple there's jed's purple there's um you know, there was the stuff that I made the lime with where I got the kind of more fuely side from the lime, which was old, um, the stuff the guy called oil can, he had stoil and he had oil can. Um, there was this guy, Ren had an old Afghani that him and a, and a partner of him, um, they, of his, they, they had, uh, they had this gnarly Afghani and, uh, and it was just like a big, crazy broadleaf, hella frosty. A lot of these things, I have seeds of them still too. They just, they're not, um, they're alive and I have them in cold storage, but I didn't store them well enough initially. So they don't have the juice to pop, but one day maybe, you know, we could bring them back in the lab. Um, so you're waiting for like mad science stuff to allow. <laughs> not <laughs> like even you, you have some dinosaur mad. DNA that you want to bring back to life. In That's awesome. Sense, in a sense, but like um, it, back in the day, I had a um, I knew a lady named Mary, and Mary, we were talking about cloning, and I think I was probably 13 or something, and she goes, "Oh well, you know, you got you guys take cuttings, you don't clone." And I go, well, you know, you can't really like clone things, right? That's like sci-fi stuff. And she, she goes, no, we, that's what we do at my job. And, um, she goes, I, I work in an orchid facility and she we actually doing tissue clone. culture, right? Yes. And so yeah. she goes, she goes, we only need a few cells. So she goes, what happens with orchids is they take years to get a flower. And so once you get the, once you get the one you want from seed of a hybrid, um, to be able to produce millions of them to ship all around the country, we have to make true clones. So we actually cut open the leaf and we get a little bit of cells and we put it on a plate and we grow it out and then we give it different hormones and it makes it get roots and shoots. And we can make millions of plants from one leaf that way over the course of a year, you know? And I was like, wow, that's really a trip. And unfortunately she passed away years ago if she was still around, I would just hit her up and go, Hey, Mary, you know, can you, can you do this for me? I'll pay you to do it. There's people who do it. I just don't know anybody well enough to want to give them stuff. Um, there's two levels of trust that I have to have. I have to trust in their skill set, and I have to trust in their ethics. Yeah. And a lot of the people who have the skill set would probably be a little questionable on the ethical side. Um, and a lot of the people who have the ethics would probably be a little questionable on the, on the other side. So I, I just keep them in the cold because I know they're still alive. And I know there's a lot of tricks I could use, but I don't want to gamble on them because 
even if you say if I have a hundred or a thousand seeds or something, if I only get a couple, that's only a little slice of, of the gene pool. So I'd rather be able to give somebody 10 seeds, get back 10 plants and breed them and see what's there. And, and maybe if there's not something that's the greatest, give them some more. Um, I'd rather give them all to them and get back a whole ton of plants, but I know it's all, you know, uh, it's, it's not, um, cost effective and, um, all that, but I mean, it's not, it's not like this, it's not like this far out thing. It's just a matter of, of finding somebody who, um, could make it happen. And I, you know, I do have some really neat stuff that I'd like to bring back, but. Well, so to me, what's interesting is I feel like in the cannabis space, people talk about tissue culture, like it's this new technology. And, and I know this guy who, you know, he, he's been doing tissue and, and he was actually in the rare flowering plant. So he was, I met him because he was helping a rare flowering plant, uh, nursery that would, that used to send stuff to like Vietnam or somewhere to propagate and then send back. And he was like, well, I could set up a tissue culture lab in your nursery and you would, you, you could eliminate the step where you have to send stuff to the far East and wait like a month for it to come back. And they were like, really? Um, so, so yeah. It, it, and then he started teaching me tissue and he was like, I could set up a lab for you right here. I was like, I'd like to do that. Yeah. And I mean, that's what, that's the thing too. That's always a trip for me is I'm like, I know the basic concepts. I mean, in high school, they, they taught us how to do it. Um, it becomes a specific skill set when you get species specific. So you need like, um, you need like the, the, the right protocol for doing cannabis, which I know nothing about, but I do know the basic steps and I know I could learn. It's just that I don't have the energy to put into that while still doing what the other stuff that I want to accomplish with the plants I actually already have viable. Um, but but that just, would be a pretty cool skill set to, to master, yeah. right? Like with your current skill set, have you added that to the lineup? Yeah. And it kind of drives me a little crazy thinking about it sometimes. Cause I go, dude, all you need is, you know, in high school, they taught us to grow <laughs> mushrooms and they taught us to do tissue culture and we didn't ever <laughs> tissue culture, anything, um, anything crazy. We tissue cultured stuff that you could have actually just stuck in the dirt. We did like, um, we did like, uh, like, uh, ice plants and cacti, you know, so there are things that you can grow anyway, but that's why they started. But what, what we did learn was sterile technique and when you know sterile technique the rest of it just becomes a recipe you know if you can get a clean plate you can get a clean plate if you know how to take a petri dish and keep it from being contaminated you're good but you have to know those other details to get it going um but i do understand that stuff and um you know i've successfully had clean petri dishes and cultured you know mycelium and plant tissue and all that but um it's just a matter of one more thing you know and so I'm always looking for somebody who's just already in the routine of it so I can just hand them some seeds and they can cut open a seed and pull out some cells and toss them on a dish you know but um you know ev eventually that's gonna happen I've met a couple people and I and I've talked to people um about keeping an eye out. And so I don't think it's like a pipe dream or too far out. If I thought nobody would ever be available to do it, I would just go ahead and try to get myself on it. But I just know that pretty soon it's going to, I think it's going to become pretty run of the mill to take old seeds and, and get them going because there's too much value in it. If anybody started that service, it would be really easy for them to demand a premium way above and beyond what a regular tissue culture lab can get for doing um, uh, some kind of a regular isolation of something else, you know, because um, because of the value these things have. Like some of these Afghanis I have, you only need a couple of the plants. They're pr they're really inbred. They're all kind of the same. So if you could just get a couple of them to be viable. I mean, if you could just get one male and reverse it, you'd have your regular male female line just from that one male. And you'd be able to go, okay, well, it's not the whole gene pool, but it's a whole lot of it. And then you'd have that tool back again. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's a matter of, um,
you know, months or years and, and not um, decades before that happened. Cause it's just crazy to think that um, it's not more practical already, you know? So can you talk about like for stuff you breed now, you have tons of seeds and then pollen, like obviously in high school and stuff like that, you weren't like rigidly following a long-term storage process for your seeds. So like, but for stuff now, kind of what's your approach to storing stuff? How long do you think it stays, you know, the seeds stay good and then the pollen as well? Okay, so with pollen, I'm not in the habit of storing pollen. Um, I should be, but I tend to just use it while I use it. And when I was had males that I wanted to use as uh, recurrent parents, then I would, I, I cloned them. And I only did that a couple times. I only ever kept a couple male clones. And, um, you know, the, the thought with the male clones has been, and also with keeping pollen in the past was if that male was really that good and that pollen was really that good, then it should be making plants that I can pull another good male out of. And if I can't, then why would I want to use that pollen or male that much anyway? That's just my logic on it. I don't know if it's completely sound because of course, if you have the same male forever, then you can bounce it off of endless individuals. And I mean, there is a lot of benefit to it. Um, it's just that when you're already trying so hard to keep those females that you really like, um, trying to keep a lot of males adds a lot to it. The males that I have this year that I'm using, I am trying to um, keep them all in clone form. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but storing pollen, I mean, I have stored pollen before. I've stored pollen for a year and had it still have some viability to the point where I thought it didn't work. And then there was some seeds in the plants that I used it on. Um, but uh, the pollen that I have stored now is done the way that um, Bodhi recommended it. And what he said was to take a jar um, take the pollen. Anytime you store pollen, even for short term, you want to make sure that it's screened really well. And um, for that, I'll make little disposable sieves for it. And what I do is I, I'll take like two containers the same way, like two, um, like two big plastic cups. And then I'll put some mesh. Um, a, a, a buddy of mine years ago, um, showed me this mesh that you can get that's basically a window curtain that you can get at Walmart and it's like a it's like a see-through curtain that's just kind of a uh, you know it's just cosmetic it doesn't actually block vision it doesn't block hardly any light but I think it's about probably 200 micron mesh and so it really it's really good you can you can use it to do like um bulk um, dry resin extractions, but you can also, um, like for your initial process, but you can also use it for pollen. So what I'll like, do is- Like, I'll like to dry sift? Yeah. Okay. So, and, and it's cool because, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't cost anything. You get, you know, a square of it that is like eight feet by 10 feet for like $4 or something, you know what I mean? And it's like, uh, it's some kind of a synthetic fiber and it, it's got a really consistent mesh. It's actually really nice for that kind of a thing. So I'll take like a cup and then I'll, I'll take the cup like this and I'll cut off this much of one of them and, or about this much of one of them. And, and then I'll have, I'll have two cups and I'll take the screen and set it on top of the regular one. And then I'll take the cut cup and I'll put it right in the top. And what it'll do is it'll make it so that there's a, you've just made a little place to screen stuff. And that way it's disposable and you don't have to worry about cross contamination like you would when people use the trim screens or um, whatever different things you do. So I'll go ahead and screen it like that. And with that, you can do, you know, a couple tablespoons worth of pollen, which is a ton of pollen really, you know, it's not very often that you'll have one individual that'll have that much. It might take you a few clones of one clone to really, uh, um, of one male to collect that much anyway. And then um, 
And then once you have that pollen, you can do whatever you want with it. But to store it long term, what um, Bodhi recommended was to take it and fold it in some construction paper so that it's, you know, all together, but the construction paper still breathes. And then um, what I'll do is leave it in a really dry place for a couple days, like two days. And then I'll take it and put it in the paper and then um, fold it up and um, put it in a jar, then with desiccant in the jar and then seal that up and then put that in the freezer. And um, I have some pollen in there that's been in a couple months right now that I'm gonna use probably this fall and so I'll get a I'll get a uh, taste of how that technique works but in the past I just put the pollen in a jar and put the desiccant right in there and just had it in the jar I think that's not quite as good of a technique because um, if the desiccant didn't take any of the atmospheric moisture out of the air inside the jar then as the jar comes out and comes to room temperature you can't open it um, while the jar's cold or all the all the air all the atmospheric moisture will just stick like a wet like a cold cup right so you have to let it come to room temperature but um if um you have it if you have it in the paper like Bodhi does I think it's one added element of insulating it from that moisture that might want to kind of stick to the the glass as it as the air becomes a different temperature you know you get the condensation um but um so that that's a good technique for pollen storage as far as i know based on what bodhi says and bodhi stores a lot of pollen and does a ton of different breedings so um i usually take uh his advice on stuff and then um for seeds what i do is pretty similar except I use little bags that um, they're not the best bags ever. They are just like little craft bags and they um, have uh, a white front so that you can write with marker on them and the marker won't wear off. If you use a regular Ziploc and you put marker on it after a while, eventually it will come off and then you might not know what it is. So I used to use Ziplocs, and then I would put a paper label inside the Ziploc with the seeds. And even before I put seeds in cold storage, my seeds used to be good for like eight years or so. And so when I was younger, I just always figured like, ah, if I didn't do anything with it in eight years, was I really going to, what, what was I going to do with it anyway? If nobody wanted them and I didn't breed it further, then what the hell am I doing with it? You know? And I used to kind of think of like, the hybrids and polyhybrids that I was making as being useful as plants, but not really as genetic stock. But I was naive to the fact that everybody would lose their stuff. I thought these people who had had it already for 10 or 15 years, they would continue having it. And it turned out in a lot of cases, what I had was all there was, because I was the only one interested in seeds and they all started growing clones. And so, um, once I came to that realization and, and I started meeting people who were interested in growing seeds, what I do now is I take them, I put them in those bags and I like to use those bags because I can put lots of notes right on the bag. So I can say this one has extra mildew resistance or extra bug resistance or extra mold resistance, um, extra sturdy, heaviest yielding, uh, less heavy yielding, whatever things make it different than the other things in that line, then I have those basic notes on there. And I don't necessarily, when I pull out my seeds to look at them, I don't necessarily have to open up some, some program or open up some journals and look through everything and go, okay, well, this is 126 B here. It is right here. I can look through as I look through my seeds and know, okay, here's that one. And it might not be all the information I have for it on the bag, but it tells me who's who. So I like to do that and use those bags. And then I take those bags and I put them into, um, into airtight containers. And then in the container outside of the bag, I put in desiccant. And um, I use this desiccant that um, is blue and then it turns pink when there's moisture present. And so 
what that'll tell you is sometimes you put something away and you thought that they are fine and they're totally dry and everything. And then you look and you go, Ooh, a few of them are starting to turn pink and then more of them turn pink. And then, you know, okay, switch out the desiccant one more time. And you can take that desiccant and put it on a cookie sheet in the oven and you can leave it in on like 200 for however long until it turns dark blue again, let it cool down and put it back into the container of desiccant that you have. And you can switch it out that way. And then it's reusable. You don't have to just continue buying tons of it. Um, but by doing that, um, you, you save the quality of the seeds. Of course, then, you know, I put those in refrigeration. But you save, you save it. And by having a, a desiccant that actually tells you when moisture is present, you know if you need to switch it out. Because what happens is sometimes maybe I have some seeds and somebody wants something and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I sh these need to come to room temperature and I let them come to room temperature, but maybe because there's so many seeds in it and so much desiccant, it's still holding on to some, um, to some of the cold um, or the heat hasn't, hasn't grabbed on all the way rather. And so when um, you open it up, there's condensation and you might not realize it. And it might just be a little bit between two of the bags in there. And so if you just had something like rice or something of a more basic traditional desiccant in there, when you close it back up, there's moisture present and you don't know there's moisture present because there's nothing to indicate it. So having that, um, having that um, desiccant in there is really a, a a valuable thing for keeping your seeds all legit. Now, if all of, if instead of being in bags, if everything was in there, was in completely airtight containers, then it wouldn't be as big of an issue. But the issue that I have with that is that if there was moisture inside of those containers that are small containers, then you would have to put desiccant directly in with the seeds in there and then you would have to check every one of those to see if the same thing is going on, where it's much easier to have it all in a big clear container and be able to look at the desiccant through the bottom of the container, you know? So um, that's how I do it and that's how I store seeds. And um, right now, like I'm planting stuff from 2014 and it's all good, you know? So um, that, that's good. And I'm trying to think of when I started storing my seeds in the cold, probably wasn't until maybe 2012 or so. Um, I think 2012, I probably took a bunch of the stuff that I had that I knew was cool um, and put it all into cold storage at that point. And so, you know, some of those things I haven't, I haven't even bothered to try to get back into, but um you know, hopefully they're good. But if you, from the very start, if when your weed is first dry, you get the seeds all the way dry, you package them up properly and you put them away. There's no reason that you can't have seeds that last for an easy 20 years. You know, like 20 years is routine. That's not a crazy number at all. And I wouldn't be surprised if somebody who is really sharp and, um, you know, I knew how to store seeds um, since... I was like 14. I just didn't ever think that it mattered that much because I didn't think I was the guy with the seeds. I was just the guy making some stuff from the real people with real seeds and my seeds were all bullshit. So then after a while, when they didn't have any seeds anymore, then I was the guy with the seeds and I didn't think I was going to be in that position. So that's why I didn't store them properly because I thought they were all kind of bastardized versions of the stuff from the real hippies with the real shit, you know? So um, I wouldn't be surprised though if somebody who actually learned that when they were young, followed through with the protocol and stored their seeds properly. If they told me, oh, I have seeds from, they, somebody could tell me right now that, that, their, that their grandpa was a seed collector and put seeds into the fridge in 1958, he got from Mexico or something and that they were still viable, I'd be like, oh, wow, well, that's a little longer than I thought, but they've been able to um, bring back seeds even without tissue culture that were really, really old. So, um, you know, I, I, um, I think potentially for somebody making seeds right now, um, 
they could be putting stuff away and have the seeds be viable for 40 or 50 years and maybe a lot longer, but 20 years routinely, no problem. You can put seeds in your, you can put seeds in your sock drawer if your house isn't too hot all the time. Um, like if your house is on, is climate controlled and it's always 72 all the time, you could probably keep seeds for 10 years at room temperature. You know, it's just when it gets really hot or it gets really humid, those are the two real enemies and coupled they're the worst. The, the, the humidity and the heat together are the most harmful. Humidity at really low temperatures isn't that bad and heat and when it's really dry isn't that bad, but when it's hot and humid, then they, the seeds just get destroyed really fast. So that's what you want to think about as far as your two enemies for storing seeds. Got it. So just by the way, anybody else in this conversation, if you guys have questions or want to talk about topics, just jump in. I have no pride of, of moderating. Um, anyone? I got a question. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, seed viability um, when it comes to the way that they're actually cultivated as far as uh, soil or living soil or modified growing mixes versus uh, somebody who's doing hydroponics. Uh, in my experience, I've, I've found that typically I get better germination rates from people who are also doing living soils. Uh, and typically that uh, the, the seeds that I grow from people who uh, cultivated in salts, they typically uh, take a little longer to acclimate to a soil system. Do you, do you like find that like similar? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't have like any real hard data on that, but I mean, I just back to what we were saying with like the microbiome and everything. I mean, I would imagine in my mind, I picture things being at their best when they're part of a living system because of evolution and just general modern scientific ideas I just think that if you you know it, that that the more the seeds had um, as far as health every advantage is going to be um, every advantage they had in their life is going to be an advantage to the seed because that that's still the live part of the plant even after the plant's gone the seed is still a live part of that plant so whatever gives the plant the best vigor um, I think you're going to have the best vigor in the seed and um, you know, like uh, just in general, as far as like uh, seeds for uh, longevity of storage and everything, like I've had seeds that I made. Um, I've had seeds that I made when the weather was really great and they really formed really well and they were all good and the seeds are beautiful and they finish when the weather is really bad because of being seeded late a little bit. Like I, in particular, I had these um, Skywalker crosses that I made and the seeds were so gorgeous. It was like, Oh, these are great. These are going to, these things will store really well. I put them, they, as soon as the weed was dry, I took them out. I was excited about all of them. I put them in cold storage and it turned out that they were not viable for longer than like a year and a half. And at first I was like, well, what the hell happened here? Did I put them away with moisture? What is it? And then, you know, I looked back at what the, at what the conditions were like. And I thought about it and I went, you know, they, they just didn't, um, they didn't finish in good conditions. And so I think what happened was probably the humidity got too high and they were in there basically like ready to come out because it, they're like, okay, we're going to sprout. And they used a bunch of their energy to sprout and then the plant got cut and they got put away and then they didn't. And I think they, I think they ate up some of their energy because they, they were too well formed to think that they had just formed poorly because the germ forms before the shell and the shell was beautiful. So um, I think like conditions, you know, the conditions can really affect um, affect stuff. And it was that same year from that same wave of seeds, there was, I think, some grape soda skunks and some Urkel cross limes. And all of those, those particular seeds were the same thing. They just didn't keep that well. And, and some of the grape soda skunks did keep really well. 
um, different plants, but some of them didn't. And, um, you know, I think that that, that that kind of conditions, as far as it just being poor conditions for the seeds, like the humidity, I think that was a factor, but back to what you said, I think that, um, you know, the same thing could come into play if, um, if essentially the, the, uh, the plants kind of on a junk food diet in a, in a less healthful, um, program, you know, I think, you know, it could be, it could be an issue for sure. You know, I just don't, I don't have anything to, to say that definitively, you know? Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. I had some, I had some old seeds from the uh, Afghani bull rider. I think we, I had talked to you about different methods to try to pop these things. And I had tried every single um, method that I, that I could think of. I used enzymes. I did the uh, hydrogen peroxide. I used gibberellic acid. And every time uh, I tried to pop any of these seeds, it seemed like there was a pathogen that would, you know, like a mold that would coat the seeds. Have you ever seen a uh, pathogen uh, seed association um, with any, any work that you've ever come across? I've noticed, you know, years ago, I used to, I used to, um, I used to have, like, I would make the seeds kind of late on one branch of, of big full term plants. And so some of the seeds would stay in lo a long time. And then maybe I'd have a whole branch and it would be seeded with a bunch of different buds. And one of the buds would be moldy. And I'd look and I'd go, oh, well, the seeds are still pretty, whatever. And I'd put them in there. And then I'd go to plant those. And, um, and then you would see some of the seeds would just, as soon as they got wet, they would just want to be moldy. And then um, beyond that, what we wound up discovering later on was that those plants would also be the ones that would want to maybe get some, some stem mold or something when they were growing. And so obviously it was just this like botrytis just carrying through on the plant and almost not systemic, but ingrained in, in, in there somewhere from an early age. And so, um, which would make sense if it, if it pops out of its shell and then it comes out and it's touching somewhere on there, you know, the, 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 you know, where the seed leaves are, you're basically, that's basically going to be the base of your plant and it's coming right out of those shells. So of course it could be right on there and could almost be, you know, getting grained there at the time until much later than, you know, it becomes a problem later. So now if there's any mold anywhere near, um, typically if something gets mold, I don't really want to grow it anyway, but sometimes you have like the anomaly of a bud that got um, something damaged about it. And I don't consider that to be part of the genetics of the plant if it really got messed up and then it molded like it was dead and then it sat and it was wet or whatever whatever happened to it so i just always make sure that if there's any mold anywhere it's not it's not it's not getting harvested you know and then um when i did have things that were um like I had like some Nepalese that I did. It didn't finish till like December and the only seeds I could get out of it, the buds had some mold on it. And I was like, well, I want the seeds. So, um, those seeds, I, um, would be sure to basically sterilize, you know, whether you, whether you give, I've done it a couple ways. You can give the, give the seeds a roll in a bag um, or in a cup or whatever in some sulfur powder and just let them sit for a little bit and then wash it all the way off because sulfur super gnarly it'll kill plants um, if it's too too much of it on there so you don't want to leave it on the seedlings just in case on the seeds just in case but um, like that or of course a peroxide soak I find that a regular peroxide soak where you use um people would say, okay, take the 3% and dilute it to 1% and then let them sit for a little bit and whatever. I, I found it didn't really work on stuff that I knew was already coming from moldy stuff or seeds that were older. And so um, what I, I started messing around with different stuff and what I found that really works was I'll actually take, um, I'll actually take um, 
peroxide and start with like a 29 or 30, 30% or whatever, you know, the really, really gnarly stuff and I'll dilute it. So it's about 6%. And then I'll, um, I'll take it and put it in like a plastic water bottle. And then I'll actually shake the seeds in that so that I know that they're really getting cleaned. And then, um, and then I will rinse it. So I know there's no peroxide on there anymore, but I'll let them sit for, you know, 10 minutes or something. So it's not penetrating the seed, but it is getting really into the coat. And then the other trick of course, is to, um, add, you know, a, like a drop of soap in there so that it actually really, it breaks the surface tension on the seed because the seeds don't really want to get, um, they don't really want to get that wet when you go to just do something briefly like that, if they're not really soaking for, you know, overnight or 12 hours or whatever. And with peroxide, um, even at 1%, you can't let them sit too long or you'll notice when they sprout, the tails will have this little scaly brownness to them because they do get burnt um, by peroxide, but definitely like cleaning them up like that. And then if you clean them up like that, it's probably best too to go ahead and roll them in some kind of a mycorrhizal uh, product so that they have some life back on them so that they can't be easily attacked. I think the combination of that, um, you could come straight out of a moldy, your buds could come, your seeds could come straight out of a moldy bud and I think they'd be okay. You know, there could still, if you did real studies, you might discover that there could be some kind of a, you know, um, aspect of them being penetrated in the hilum of the seed or something. But I, I don't think so. I think you can clean them up. So. Yeah, that's the method that I tried. I, I did, I diluted down the uh, stronger hydrogen peroxide. I just couldn't get it. And then I was in the same predicament that you were talking about where, you know, who, who can I uh, have tissue culture these types of seeds that isn't going to run off with genetics for their own purpose, you know? So uh, that's always like, I don't know. It, it's weird though, too, because now I, the facility I work at, we actually have a PCR machine, which we can do genetic sequencing, sex testing, and we can do genetic marking for genetic assisted breeding. We also have like mycology and bacterial incubators, but uh, we just haven't, we just haven't started to use them yet. And I'm not a, a laboratory technician by any means. So I'm waiting for, you know, to learn those skill sets to hopefully be able to use those to find out, Hey, this is exactly, you know, the trait that we want for, you know, botrytis resistance. And then we can know that all we have to do is when we pop seeds, we can take a tissue sample of it and then it replicates the DNA and it'll say, oh, yep, there's that marker that we put in it. So we know that this clone or this seedling or which seedlings have these, these genetic crossovers and you can do all, you know, breeding based off of looking at all the different uh, characteristics, you know, that you've been able to mark. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's definitely, that's, you know, um, in modern breeding, that's really the, that's the way to do everything, you know? I mean, we're lucky when we do stuff without that and it works, you know? But um, it's really a trip too. Like um, if you follow, you follow uh, Kevin McKernan on yeah, Instagram. Absolutely, yeah. It's really interesting how he'll, how, how he'll put up some stuff, you know? And a lot of it's over my head. Even some of the graph types, I don't have like a statistics education to even, there's, he puts up some graphs sometimes where it takes me like, 20 minutes just to learn how to read the graph and I'm like wow this is a trip but it's such cool stuff where um I really like when he's analyzing like okay well here is here is this trait but look at this attached thing and if you get rid of this trait then look at what else you get rid of and you start yeah. to see like oh god so, so so traditional breeding in a sense is really um cool because you wind up keeping those things just because um just because you don't care about specifics as much and then with real agriculture stuff they're so um they're so inclined to look at things on such a specific level that things just get chopped out and then you know of course they're going to have these disasters he's like look you get rid of the thca you get rid of the mold resistance. And so people got these hemp crops. They're like, look, it's, we did, we, we did modern breeding te techniques and we found the markers and we removed the THC and then they grow it all out. And they're like, 
hmm, we have no crop, you know, and it's, it's yeah. nuts. It's a trippy, it's a trippy thing, but, um, but it's yeah, all valuable. It's just, there's a huge learning curve with going forward to that modern side, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, I think that too, I, I mean, for me, I like to really push organics because I think there's been such a misconception in the community about salt grown, uh, I mean, it, it, like everything from rap songs about hydro and, and, you know, the, a lot of the early stuff I did hydro for nine years and before I started, before I switched over. And, uh, I like to push that just because I feel like the, the expression that I get is just, there's more depth to it. Like you have all these overtones and you have these unique, subtle, uh, profiles from all the different flowers that I don't necessarily get. Like you get some of them, but you get more of the depth. You get more like robustness in the, in the, in the, you know, in the terpene profiles, I feel like. Yeah. I mean, it's trippy. Sometimes I hear people, um, I hear people like who don't like soil grown weed and they're like, it smells like soil. And like, I'm like, like my favorite one of my favorite things about the smells of weed is like when they're earthy, you know, <laughs> like I like that. There's like a, there's like a, a cool thing to a lot of strains that they are earthy and maybe it does have something to do with the earth, but uh, that's actually in the soil and everything. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's trippy because um, it's almost like, anytime you talk to people about organics it's like there's not it's like there's two different conversations happening within the conversation where it's really not a conversation because people who are attached to the idea of of salt grown stuff um they're really all about in a lot of cases the efficiency the effectiveness of the foods um, you know, the, the cleanliness, everything being sterile and simple and streamlined and, um, and, uh, you know, the high THC numbers and for a lot of what, like for commercial cannabis, it's like, yeah, salt grown is like, it's the shit. It's what, it's how people, um, it's how people have a really effective recipe for their business model, you know? But then for me, I'm like, I don't really give a fuck about the business model because I don't, um, like I've never looked at weed in that way where it's like, okay, how do we scale up? How do we maximize profit? How do we, to me, I'm like, that's cool, but that's like a whole other, I'm not even involved really in that conversation. Cause for me, it's always been a matter of having the baddest bag of weed. I just want the baddest fucking bag of weed. So like, it's a totally different thing because I, I can't like tell these people, Hey, you should grow organics and do it for this and the subtlety and this and that, like people don't want to hear it. And I don't, I don't really even care to tell them. And I don't think that they need to do it the way I need that. I want to do it, but it's just funny because like the, for me, it's really simple that I want to have my shit be organic because I've grown both ways. I've grown with fucking salts and purely nothing, but you know, and, and I've, I've even smoked people's weed before where I was like, when I was young, that I was like, wow, this is really nice. You know, what do you use? And they were like, fucking Peters, fucking, you know, whatever, 20, 20, 20, or some cheap ass salts. And that's all they did. And the weed was good. But what was funny was it, but it would turn out that it'd be like, oh, well, what do you, what's the soil? And it would be like, oh, we use like half the manzanita mulch from underneath where we're at. And like the madrone duff under the leaves where it's all black and shit. That way we don't have to haul in as much dirt. And then when we get to the last, like, to the last like 20 days, then we don't feed them anything. And I'm like, well, as soon as the salt rinses out of their soil, there's probably this huge fucking bloom of <laughs> microbiology. And so they actually were getting all this really cool shit in there, in their terpene profile and their smoke. And I try to, I try to, I try to look at it blindly with like, okay, well, these people use 
the system they use and it's really cool and somebody will be like no dude you gotta try this weed i mean it's salt grown um production weed but dude these guys nail it and i'm like dude like this doesn't smell like dog food to you guys like it smells like dog food to me like this is like a fucking like a fucking fish farm where they're feeding kibble to the fish or like like it just doesn't seem right it's not um I don't know. It just, it never, it, I, you roll the joint, your hands are dry. Like there's no goo. It never feels fucking duct tapey on your fingers. It's like, or, and then, or you, get, you, know, you get that, uh, that bud that's beautiful and you crack it open and it just turns to powder and you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have any of the, the structure, the structure, like the cellular shit. It's just weird, you know? And then, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's really trippy. But then I, but then like we, we always grew indoor and this is the thing I grew indoor for somebody one time uh, for a few runs and they wanted me to use, they wanted me to use a product, which I'm not even going to bash, but it's fucking awful. And they wanted me to use. Are this you product. sure we can't name the product? Maxi, Maxi. But they wanted me to use this product and you put the water in it and it looks like fucking, it looks like lemon lime Gatorade. And there's all this like <laughs> sand at the bottom, like, oh, this is organic, you know, like, look, we put sand in here. So people are like, it's organic based. I'm like, cause there's fucking gravel in it. What, the, what is this <laughs> shit that doesn't melt? Like you can't even use this with the, with the siphon feeder they had me using and stuff. And I'm just like, well, what is this? And then you, uh, you grow the weed and you get to the end and you finally get to have some bud from it. And you're like, I don't even want this weed. Like, I just don't want to smoke it. It's, it feels dry. It smokes dry. It doesn't have the right mouth feel. It doesn't have the right lung feel. It's just weird, um, weird and not, not what I'm looking for. And then, uh, and then you grow with soil and you use something really basic and silly like Fox Farms Big Bloom that's just like a guano tea and um, or earth juice. And you grow with that and your weed's done and you smoke it and you're like, fuck, this is really good weed. Like, I see why people like indoor so much because this is like my outdoor, but it's just a little more the, the, the flavors on it are really just like tuned up and there's a little bit of stuff that I don't get off of this strain when I grow it outside. And even sometimes it might be more plain inside, but it's still just so good. And the resin is different and you go to make hash off of it. Like in the back in the day, I used to always do on a dry screen and I would just screen it and it would be like, damn, this is such, such crazy melt. And then you grow the same thing with the other stuff and you're like, it's good, but like I'm having trouble on my hand screen making melt. Like it's really, really hard to get it to do it. And, um, you know, I mean, of course this is all uh, anecdotal and I'm not trying to say that it's impossible and that maybe someone doesn't have it, but I haven't seen it. And I've seen when we go and do all the shows, um, my buddy, um, uh, Shanti farms, he goes around and he buys eighths from everybody. And, um, he's like, yeah, I got this one, this one, this one. And we sit there and he pops them open and we got a dozen kinds of things sitting there. Maybe there's four of the best ones from these guys and four of the, and he's like, one of these has got to be great. And you try them all. And it's like, miss, miss, miss. These all suck. And then I'll pull out some like 16 month outdoor and hand him that and he's like damn this is fire what's this you know and it's just i think because of the that thing of the microbiome and everything that is working to give these uh little trippy micronutrients and exudates and all this different stuff coming from this real soil web you know and um you know it just it's just funny because we you know you try I try to like everybody's stuff and I try to believe in the process and go, okay, well, I know these guys are really educated. They've seen a lot of weed. What's their stuff like? And then you're like, Meh. this is all whack. You know, it's a trip. It's really weird. You know, so, so go ahead. 
Uh, I started uh, doing, um, uh, taking my green waste from when we do pruning, taking a water leaf and fermenting that using the uh, Micro Plus, which is the consortium of the Bacillus, Saccharomyces, and the right up Pseudomonas. And I turned that into a biological fertilizer and I can dilute that with water and use that as both a uh, biological inoculant and uh, to add uh, the uh, minerals and nutrients from plant matter. And, it, and that seems to, the plants respond really, really well to it. So that's something that I think that I'll be implementing in the facility that I'm running. Because it's, it's been interesting because I try to do, uh, basically, I'm running the same style that I was before I, I went, was on the, before I was uh, in the legal market. And I'm doing all no-till, all organic, just the amendments and then biological inoculations. And it works really, really well. Um, I think the biggest thing is I do have to worry about, you know, how can I produce large quantities as well? So... Um, I think that just comes to, down to genetics, though, you know, doing the pheno hunts and finding the best varieties to run in those spaces that are going to give the, the highest possible quality along with the uh, production. But I found that the bio, that biologicals really, really help out. I think that makes a huge difference in overall health of the plant and soil. Yeah, I think so. And I think like market wise, um, that's why I say it's almost like two different conversations. Like I'm not going to tell these guys they should do it. Cause like you're saying, it's hard to, it's hard to do it. Um, organic if you're indoor and you want this sterile environment and everything like that's all cool, you know, and the market, what does the market want? 30% THC. And it looks good on it. It looks good in the photograph. It looks good in the bag and you can flex on people and be like, Oh, this is chronic. And no, and everybody's used to that weed. So nobody really, nobody really knows. So it doesn't really matter. Like if you, um, you know, if you like things to be a certain way, like, cool. It's not that I think that they completely don't know. I think they might be used to that um, to the point where it doesn't really matter for them. But for me, I like, <laughs> that was very a very beautiful. polite way of describing them. Well, there's just like, for me, there's like certain weed. I can only enjoy so much weed. I'm like, if you guys are really enjoying this and this is what you like, then, you know, cool. Like it's not, um, I don't think there's anything really wrong with that. It's just that for me, like as smoking, there's only, some, there's only a little bit of weed that I really, that I really like. I mean, like, um, some of the only, uh, indoor that I that I see that I really like like when I, I can just kind of I can kind of feel the weed and go Ooh, okay this will be nice because when I smoke weed I want it to have a lot of oil content so that it has more of a rich kind of a steaminess to the smoke and not just a dry empty thing but I think for a lot of people um, they're just trying to they want it to look pretty and then they want to get off you know, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But like, I feel I, like that's an empty high, right? That really high THC for me, it's like, you know, I want to be stoned, right? I, I want yeah. a full stone. I don't want to be just high, you know, just for a little bit. I want the, all of the, uh, the effects and nuances that go with like the maximum expression of, uh, of a variety. You know, if, if you have something that, you know, is going to be really uplifting, that's going to get you going, that's going to be real, you're going to be real focused. I want to, I won't really feel that. I want to express that. If you know, you have something that's going to be the opposite or in between, or you can make you more creative, you know, I just feel like the, ex like the experience for me plays a huge role because I don't have to smoke a lot to get high. You know, I can smoke a couple of bong hits and I'll know, like, and I'll be able to feel the effect. So that's, that's the one thing that I, that I, that for me personally, uh, I'd rather have like a lower THC variety. That's just, that has that, like you're saying that oil to it, that stuff that just real, it's, it's crazy because you, when you're breaking it up in your hands, you're like, man, is this going to even smoke in this joint? But then you roll it up and no, it smokes great, but it feels like, you know, it has that texture to it. That's just not dry and brittle. It doesn't flake up when you roll it. It has structure to it. I mean, those are the types of weeds that, for me, I uh, I get the full experience from. That's yeah, you know, I'd rather have an eighteen percent with a four or five percent terp 
anytime than a than a 30% with with no nose on it, you know, it's just not as good. Yeah, all the all the best weed that I ever um, remember smoking that was really the best was like, uh, it would be you you'd be I remember like we would be tripping on mushrooms. And you'd go to roll it and you'd be like, I broke up the weed. So someone else needs to roll it because there's no way that I can roll right now with my hands this sticky, you know? And I, I really can't remember the last time I saw salt grown indoor that was any issue to, I mean, it's more a question of when you go to roll it, you're trying to keep the weed from falling out the ends. Cause it's just, it just won't stick together. The weed won't even stick to the weed, you know? And I'm like, this is, this is supposed to be the shit. Like that's not, you know, I mean, they say it's the ooey gooey for a reason, you know, if it's not like, if it doesn't have any, any, uh, grease, grease factor and stickiness factor to it, it just doesn't, it don't do it for me, you know? Did I just, <laughs> I just went to grab a beer. <laughs> um, so there, 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 uh, we could take this conversation in a lot of different directions. Um, I mean, one of the things, you, so let me actually go into some questions, uh, from some of the chat that they're like almost 400 people or last day I checked almost 400 people watching over two hours in. So Awesome. Thank you to the audience. Um, well, actually, let, let me just finish one topic, which, you know, um, or since I get to ask questions, um, with, with your breeding, um, like w when do you pollinate and then, uh, how do you put, like, are you putting males in with the females or using pollen and applying it? And then, and then when, when, like, what's your sweet spot for pollination? So, I mean, um, the stuff that I tend to do is in a pretty close window, um, because I don't tend to do really long running strains and I've never been able to really find many that are super fast that are, um, the greatest. I only have a couple of those, so it tends to be stuff tends to be, you know, nine or nine or 10, 11 weeks is like kind of that window where it seems like a lot of the, the best stuff is. And, um, and, uh, when I say best, I mean like, um, kind of all around, like good, good for the market and good for the grower and good for, you know, me as what I actually like for my personal tastes. So, um, depending on how I want to do it. I mean, so, because I like to do a pretty decent number of things, I have to do a few different, a few different techniques. So sometimes if things are a little earlier than the rest and I only need enough to keep it around for myself, like if I'm growing like deep chunk, the males will come off um, and the females before anything else, because it's one of those fast flowering things. And, um, that's one of those more, more on the short, short side before everything else. And so those ones, I might, when the males first start getting a little bit of pollen, I'll collect some, and then I'll do a little, I'll do a little hand pollination, or I'll go ahead and maybe do um, maybe do an open pollination if they're before anything else is, is going to be, um, flowering and, uh, you know, they'll still be off in their own area and everything, but it makes it a little bit more, a little easier to know that you're not screwing anything up. And then, um, that's the same deal for things that I don't need many seeds of. A lot of times I'll do those things earlier. And then that way I don't get as many seeds, but they're really beautiful seeds and they'll store the best because they're the most big, gnarly, mature seeds. And, um, um, those, that kind of helps me to get those out of the way. Then if I really want to make a lot of seeds of something, then I'm going to want to take those males 
and those females, like if I have like my, um, if I'm doing a multiple male breeding, then, you know, the, the, the few males that are going and then all the females and then those, I want to like put them in a room for a couple days and really seed it. And at the very least, maybe, um, put the males in there and let them really start really opening up and then maybe just put the females in and maybe just seed them and have them, um, just be fully seeded. And then that way that's like corn on the cob. I call it, you know, you just seeds, it's just the plants are straight up seeded. Now the perfect window for making a few seeds might only be, they might only have to be a couple weeks into flower, you know? Um, but then like, you know, three to four weeks more to get the real full, fully, fully seeded stuff. Um, and then, um, after those are done, then after those are made, then maybe some more select hand pollinations here and there to make more stuff, maybe for like test crosses to see how these two gene pools you know, went together. Um, and then if I'm making something in with those big pollinations where there's the males and put inside in a room and then with the females of it, and then I'll probably take some clones that I think might be a good match and then put those in there to, at the same time to make some outcrosses. And so sometimes that's why stuff that I release, it's I might only release a little bit of it because if I release... 20 packs that might be half of the seeds that I had of that after I grew some out you know um and those so sometimes too that's why those ones um you know I want more for them because I'm basically like taking half of my potential for breeding that and I'm letting it out and I'm not going to have it and so when somebody finds that crazy one and they have it it's theirs and I missed it because I can't grow it because I got rid of it you know um and those tend to be the things that are like that's like a hybrid like gelato 33 cherry limeade I didn't have very many of those but when I did them outside and I gave them to a few people outside it was like they were like damn those were great and I looked at them and I was like those those really came out good so I was like all right well I'll do 20 I let out 25 packs of them you know um so those are like um uh, those are the, those are those ones that are just made a little bit piggybacking on the breeding that was already going on. As I was making a bunch of cherry limeade seed, I made a little bit of, of gelato cherry limeade seed. Um, and then, you know, like I said, like those, those basic things, then maybe like a little bit of like an odd land race thing that does run late, then I can go ahead and make that after everything else just by hand, just to make some so that I know I have it when I say some, that's like, you know, a matter of hundreds of seeds as opposed to thousands. Whereas when you're going corn on the cob, you have, you know, one of those plants might be, might have, um, five or 8,000 seeds on one plant. But, um, if they're all from seed and it's not a whole bunch of clones, when you did it, then your favorite plant, um, out of that whole breeding, even though it's like you might've put 10 plants in and they all have 5,000 seeds on them. You only have 5,000 seeds from the plant when you grow it out that are the ones that were your favorite. And then now your whole stock to go forward is uh, of that particular line from that plant is that. And then um, once you grow them out and you wanna put some of them out from that generation, um, you're only left with, with however many you're left back with. And it might be the case that I release, you know, a hundred packs and now I have 4,000 seeds, but I don't want to work with that for years because I'm on to something else. And now those are in storage. And by the time I plant them, I don't know, maybe I'm only going to have a certain percentage of those seeds coming back up, you know? So, um, you know, it's all a matter of trying to figure out what, um, you know, there's enough of to release or there's enough of to give away. And then, you know, you have to give people to, 
to grow them out so you know what you really have and all that and so um, there's all different levels of making a little bit a little bit early of something for myself and then making a bunch of this and then making some later. So I only really wind up with so many things that um, I could release or give away. Cause a lot of them, I just only made a little bit and that's the only way to do a lot of different things in my situation, you know, without having like a, a motel worth of breeding rooms or something, you know? Uh, so related to that, I, I think kind of a relevant question. Long fam asked, uh, he says, ask Jack, no, sorry. He said, uh, can we ask Jackson a selection process for males? So for males, um, and I've said this before, I really like to learn. Um, I like to learn what's in there first. So sometimes the first time I grow something, I'll keep a male but like um usually i'll grow something first and i'd ideally like to grow a couple waves of it so if i have a new cross that i made um ideally i'd like to grow you know 10 females and then grow another 10 females and kind of get a picture of which ones you know and if i can grow 50 or 60 females but get a picture of what the females are like that I, that I really want from it and then try to pick a male that's like them, you know? So I like to like educate myself about what types look a certain way and try to find um, a consistent correlation between a look and an end result and then try to use a male that's like that. So if I'm growing a cush cross and I notice that the narrow leaf females with a certain color are always the ones I like better than these other ones, then I'm going to want to use a male that's like that. And then I'll keep a bunch of males that have that look and then I'll let them flower most of the way. And then if some of them flower a little bit heavier, more, um, more of a look that I want, maybe sturdier branches, maybe a little bit better branching, um, maybe, um, and I and I like with males, I don't like to like treat the males, like I don't wanna like sulfur the males or spray them with anything for bugs or anything like that, because I, I wanna see if there's any of them that lack resistance to a certain thing. So if I keep eight males that all have the certain look, out of the original 30 or 40 males, then I want to see what they do all the way up to the point where I'm going to get to the point where I'm about to use them and then figure out what are the very best ones. And at certain times, I might wind up with two or three that I consider to be like exactly the same. And in those cases, I might go ahead and use multiple males. Um, but if I don't, and there's only one that really stacks up to the, to the criteria that I'm trying to judge them for, then I'll wind up with that one good champ male, and then I'll use that one. So, you know, there's a lot of generalized things to look for in a male as far as just as it's a, the kind of plant you like to grow. But then it has to fit the description of, um, of what you were looking for from the breed in the first place. You know, like if I like this strain because it grows monster plants, there's no way I'm going to pick the small male. If I like it because it has really strong, um, gnarly branches that grow way out like a candelabra shape, I'm not going to pick the one that doesn't have any branches. If I like this strain mainly because of the kind of terps it has and all the females that get the kind of terps I like happen to smell a certain way on a stem rub. I'm going to look for the male that has that type of stem rub. Um, if, you know, everything was perfect about the male, but then it had some major issue, like it really likes to get mildew more than other plants that are in the same population then I might just say, fuck it and not even breed that time and then keep my favorite females and reveg them. And then, um, or maybe just outcross them to do something with it for fun. 
and then go ahead and go back and, and, and grow more plants to try to find the male because I didn't find it this time, you know. I don't necessarily always just jump on it because it because I need one. It's got to fit. Um, it's got to fit its position. Otherwise, it's not. Uh, it's it's not helping me. You know, it's going to set me back. So that's my that's most of my process, I think. And then uh, related to that, long fam had a follow up. Uh... How many times have you selected a male with similar female characteristics, but in the end it turned out to be duds? Um, trying to think of really like a particular instance of that happening. Although I feel like if you're struggling to find an instance, it's probably not that common. It's not common at all. And I'm actually trying to think like, um, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't really think of a time that it happened. Um, it, it, it's only really happened when I use the males just because it's the one I have. So like back in the day, I had this strain called Barry and I had this one called Sweat that's this really cool old clone. And I crossed them together and I got these big monster plants and they were neat and they weren't, they, they didn't get the best of both things, but they were just really good plants that really got a lot of weed and it was good enough weed. It wasn't, didn't have really the magic of either side. But I wound up, I remember, I think at F2, picking this male because I liked how it looked, but it was on the smaller side. And, but it had this cool look like the sweat, but sweat is a bigger growing plant. And so I kind of thought, well, maybe this isn't genetic that the male's small. Maybe I screwed it up. Maybe it was a weird seed. And this is just an acquired thing. And I bred it and I remember growing the next seeds out of those and going, yeah, all of these are just, they're just all not what I want. And they were all small and that was like a dead end on that cross and I never worked with it. Um, I never worked with it any further just because it, it lacked a few things I wanted. But I can still picture that mail and I can still remember using it thinking okay it has some of the traits from that original female that i really want but it doesn't have all of them and then breeding it and growing it and going yeah this is this is bullshit and just not ever doing anything with it again um but it seems like usually if you know the line well enough and you pick a male that is what you think is going to be good, um, you have a pretty good odds of it not being, not being too bad. You might still have to go through stuff, but it's really hard to analyze without doing a ton of outcrosses with just the male, whether the undesirable stuff came from the female side or from the male side. So it's hard for me to say um, that that was the case, you know, that it was that I picked the male that was like the girl and then it didn't work. You know, it, sometimes the girls, um, they don't carry much of what you want either, you know? So, 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 so the American one actually asked a question that's kind of relevant to what you're touching on. Please ask if me and Gina has noticed traits that are passed from mom or dad only. You just mentioned if a male is prone to mold, he won't use it. Is he sure that traits or that trait is shared? Um, I know very little about sex linked traits. Um, I do know that it's a real thing. I do remember that I had a Salmon Creek Big Bud cross with Barry, which was the male side of the one I was just talking about. Um, which was like, um, was like a big bud, a big bud perp, perp being like this old Burmese syndica thing that's in like grape soda skunk and pina. Um, 
and uh, and the berry um, crossed with the Salmon Creek Big Bud. And I'm trying to remember, I feel like it was also when I had the, the Pog crossed with the Salmon Creek Big Bud. There were these plants that we would get and as soon as I saw that type, which was a really pretty type of plant, um, I would know it was a boy as soon as I saw it. Because after going through hundreds and hundreds of them, we just started to notice, hey, this one right here, this nice, big, sturdy, upright plant with these certain leaves and this certain green color, um, it was always males. And that is really interesting because it's actually a whole type and a lot of times when people say like trait they are talking about a really big set of traits so they're like oh did you get the og trait when you cross that it's like well which trait like the smell the structure the thc production there's tons of things that make a type be a certain type right and that particular type I only saw in male form and I saw it across um, a lot of plants, definitely more than dozens. I can't say necessarily hundreds, but probably hundreds because back then we had a lot of plants. Um, so um, I've always kind of looked at that and, and, and thought that was a trip, that that was a whole big set of traits that were obviously um, sex linked traits, but I don't really know. Um, I don't really know what is linked to what, and I don't believe that it would be like a global thing across all different strains. Like there's these weird things that happen that make you think that you've learned this about cannabis, but you've really only learned it about one little slice of the gene pool. They behave a certain way. Um, an example of that is like with males that get some hairs when they get later in life, in a lot of cases are an indication that you just have a hermaphrodite line. And the boys get hairs and the girls get balls. And it just means that they're, they're Hermy. And I've talked to um, the inspector about this from CSI and I asked him about it. And he said, yeah, those are just Hermes. And the thing that raised the original question was reading about um, Tom Hill discussing it and saying he had read that from DJ Short. I got a little bit interested in it and I asked different people about it and different people have different takes on it. Um, Inspecta's take was that those are always Hermes and, um, and undesirable because of it. And that is his experience and is true. And he's probably the most transparent, um, uh, scientific, talented dude. I mean, him and, um, him and uh, Shaw Bud from 707 Seed Banks are they're, they're like the, the two dudes that I'm like, if, if I can pick their brain, I always want to ask them about stuff because I know that they're very, uh, um, they're very intelligent, but they also don't uh, color things with their opinion very much. But what's interesting is that even though that was Inspector's experience, then I know, um, of a few other lines, and I don't even really like to mention them because of the stigma surrounding, uh, he just said stigma, um, males that get stigmas. Um, it's really a weird thing because these other lines, in those cases, the males all get some hairs on them um and they are completely bulletproof and cannot barely like they're probably hard to even reverse chemically they just will not stress you can grow them in a hot ass depth with light leaks and screw up the hours and they will still just be totally great um so that's an interesting thing where um you know, talking about back to the point of sex-linked traits, 
I personally don't know a lot about them, but my hypothesis about them would also be that what's true for one thing is not necessarily true for another, meaning that, um, you know, there, there could be some, there could be some different ways that, that, um, that that could go. Like there might be some strains where a mold resistant male doesn't mean mold resistant females. There might be other ones where a mold resistant male means you're just guaranteed yourself mold resistant females. Um, my opinion on it is that if a male, um, I kind of like to, towards the end of when males are done, I kind of like to spray them down and see which ones rot um, and which ones don't. And I have noticed that the males from lines that rot easier tend to have females that are less mold resistant. That's like deep chunk or certain lines of the grape soda skunk. They're very chunky. The males are like the females. They get really like gnarly knobs of, of flowers and they're like super dense and hardcore. And then um, when you spray them down with water towards the end, they just explode with mold. And other males don't like more OG based males or sour diesel based males. Those are really pretty uh, mold resistant lines. But when you take these other lines like deep chunk and you spray down the males, boom, it's just mold city. So there does seem to be a correlation there with what I'm experienced with. But back to the thing of the stigmas growing late out of the male clusters, um, it obviously one doesn't always mean that it's it's global across all different strains you know there's different um things at play in different strains so um you know i i don't really know the specifics but that's my experience with with that with with moldy males you know okay so along the same lines uh so Cascadian grown asked, can you ask uh, Gene if the approach is different for selections when he's selecting for recessive genetics and a line, if 45 to 50 looks same and he wants the other, does it change? Read it back to me again. Can you ask if the, if the approach is different for selections when he's selecting for recessive genetics in a line? Um. I, I think what he's saying is, is it still okay to just have 45 or 50 plants? Is that, was that what you get from it when you hear it? Sometimes when I hear, sometimes when I hear questions like that, I don't quite understand what they mean, but I think. Um, how, how, how about this? Let's come back to this one. So the American one, uh, can you rephrase your question? So it's clear. Uh, so blue of green tank, Tyler, uh, Asked, how important is a fake winter for a seed stock, if at all? I mean, mimicking the natural winter or cold period, not freezing per se, but uh, that cannabis seed would go through in order to boost germination rate of, or holdability storage of seed stock like a real winter. My experience is that once seeds are fully dry, you can grow them. I originally was told that if plants don't freeze then they can't sprout seeds but um then I was growing I was working in people's gardens who had seeded plants and we were like whoa this plant's getting a crazy flush of new hair so late and we discovered that they were actually all the seeds were sprouted in the buds but I can't say for sure if I've ever seen that without a freeze so I feel like if seeds are still fresh and in the plant, they might need to freeze to be able to sprout first. Um, but I think that once you cut down seeds and you dry the plant and you pull seeds out of fresh bud, um, you'll have 100% germination rate right away. I don't, in my experience, see a need for um, a false winter versus maybe something like, I think opium seeds, you kind of have to freeze. 
And then I have opium seeds that are 20 years old in my freezer and they're still like a hundred percent. Um, but I don't know if they would have come up if I hadn't froze them. I, I mean, that could be another, you know, that could be, um, a myth as well, but I would put the false winner or true winner, um, being necessary, I, I would think that that's kind of a myth at this point with my experience, because it seems like as soon as it's dry, you pull out some seeds and boom, you can sprout them if you want. All right. So, uh, yeah, the American one, I just realized that that was not your question, but Cascadian Grown has clarified the question. If 45 of the 50 plants all look similar, but he wants to isolate the other five plants, does the approach to selecting males change at all? ran out of character uh sorry you said he ran out of characters last time yeah i mean if that was the case is if if you're if you're going through something and you find out that something is very infrequent it might not even be recessive the the interesting thing about things being dominant or recessive is that just because something is um dominant doesn't mean that it'll be super frequent in the population so um sometimes things don't pop out very much in the seed you have because of how it's bred but once you breed it that particular plant you'll get tons of them right away as if it is um as if it, it came out of something frequent the lime is an example of that the lime was originally very rare um in the seed but it was dominant so as soon as i bred with a limey plant i got lots of limey plants so it went from one in 50 to being um like half right away because it was it was dominant it was just very infrequent so if you plant something and you find out that it is that what you're looking for is infrequent then that's where I'm going to go ahead and go, okay, there's, I only have five to select from out of 50. Now, next time I better grow hundreds of these instead so that I can get a decent slice to actually find a male that is the way I, I want it to have. So, yeah, I mean, it would, that would change that um, aspect of it for sure, because you found out that you, you need a much bigger, um, a bigger uh, selection, you know? All right. Sorry. There's a lot of chat going on right now. Um, so two people, Long Fam and Blue of Green Tank, both. So asked Jackson when root beer crosses are coming back and Blue said, what is the future of root beer? Um, well, root beer is a trip. Um, it, it really loves it outside. Um, I feel like you even get the best expression of the weed outside. Um, but it, it's really, it's really, um, the clone is stable inside everything that I've bred from it. When you put it inside for the most part, um, it's hard to have stable crosses from it. So it's one of those things where I might wind up releasing some stuff from it specifically for outdoor because outdoor, it doesn't rot. It's sturdy. The stretch is insane. You can plant a small plant like near the end of July and still get like, you know, a, a couple pounds off of it, a few pounds off of it. It's really, um, it's really an amazing plant. The smoke is a trip, even pretty much from any seed, you get the same enjoyable stuff. Um, you can smoke it and it will cut through whatever you were smoking so hard that you'll almost think you're sober for a second. And then you'll realize that you're really fucking stoned. Um, but it's really clear and uplifting, but it's powerful. Uh, it's the root beer is great, but you know, it's just not, um, it, it's really hard to find ones to breed out of the seed that are um that are super stable um inside or even in a even in a, a rinky dink death so i'm not really sure what the future is for it at this point um it's just a funny thing because it's such a great performer and it's so solid outside and then it's just super shaky you know when you try to take it inside 
Um, there's some people who have some going of it. Um, Cush Family Crew up in Washington has a killer one that is um, uh, raspberry cream soda. That's a root beer seed. They're doing that. They're killing it with that. It's really nice. Um, Skunk Tech's done a little bit of work with it. Um, Source Genetics, uh, the real OG Cushman, he has uh, the Root Brother Cross, which is killer. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. It's just that um, I'm trying not to do outcrosses with it as much. I want to really try to get it better. So I think my only real path forward that I see that I can really, really get it to be better. I think I basically need to self the original mother and find um, an exact copy of her that doesn't carry that um, instability and then begin working from there. And um, then I think even F, if I made F1s off of maybe a, a first or second generation selfing that was really stable from her, then I think I could get rid of the, um, of the garbage that we don't want in there. But um, at this point, it just isn't, you know, everybody's like, release it, release it. I'm like, you can't release that. It's just not, it's not something to release right now. Um, it is great to grow and I could definitely release some outcrosses that would be stable. The thing about a lot of that instability is it comes more from when you, um, when you try to inbreed it and then you hit those recessives. And if you outcross it, then you can mask that. And um, so I'm sure I could take, I could make like root beer bubba and you would probably get some root beer plants and they'd probably pretty much all be stable. But as soon as somebody made root beer Bubba F2s, they'd be like, oh shit, here's, here's these nanners again back here on the bottoms, you know? So um, that's the uh, story with the root beer right now. Kyle or Brandon, you guys are, are very quiet during this conversation. You got any, any deep thoughts or questions? Kyle, I was trying to catch you falling asleep. Actually, I I, I was like, I think his eyes well, are closed, and I cut to you. <laughs> this, this man learning from the man, you know. You're you're soaking it all in. Oh yeah, as much as I can. Uh, okay. So, d do you have any questions or comments on what he's saying, or do you want me to? I can keep going. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I did have one question for him. I didn't know if uh, there's any you know, strains he's tried to make that he just cannot get viable seed out of. I've had one or two experiences that, you know, it's a beautiful female and no matter what I hit her with, at, at what timing, I just cannot get viable seed out of it. Do you get seed out of it at all? No, I can't. No matter what pollen I've hit it with, at, at what week and flower, it just, she will not throw seed. Just not a single one. No, no, I've, I've hit her with uh, some gibber oak acid. I've tried S1-ing it, you know, and the, the thing just yeah. will not throw. Well, that's actually kind of neat because it seems like you probably have a, um, a female that is, um, that is uh, not fertile, which would be like, um, you know, let's make 10,000 clones of that and plant it in the middle of a Kentucky hemp field and let it grow wild and then we'll just go back and cut down two tons of dope in October, you know? <laughs> It'll be sensimia because it can't make yeah. fucking. So um, I was just listening to Breeder Steve talk about this actually and he's working yeah, on a that, That's what I was just gonna say. I talked to him about that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so it's actually a pretty a valuable kind of plant to find um, because like I said, you can take that clone and you can plant that clone um, next to anything. I myself have never found one. Um, I've, I've, everything that I've ever tried to seed, I was able to at least, some things don't get many seeds or some things I've, I've made seeds and the seeds weren't any good because maybe in my timing or maybe because the plant just doesn't, you know, it just forms little, little husks of seeds that aren't the goods. But um, it sounds to me like you have a a um a basically a barren plant and um 
I mean, if I had it, I'd keep the clone because that could be really valuable to somebody who can't grow otherwise because they're next to a hemp field or um, I always wanted one like that so that back in the day, you know, when everything was always like a pipe dream of how could you actually grow some dope because it used to be really hard to pull anything off. I used to be like, wow, there's wild hemp. If we could find um, a, uh, a barren female and, and clone it and go stick it in those fields, you could just go back. Weed already grows wild there, dry, just dry cropping, you know. Um, it, it could be cool for some stuff, you know. Yeah, definitely. It's actually, uh, it's, it's an interesting lady too. Uh, she's got anywhere from like 7 to 10% CBG and up to 18% THC generally so it's a it's a real cool feeling too i just I, i've been trying to make seed out of her and she just will not give it up wow trippy yeah yeah but yeah i mean that's what i would that's you know that's what would be my guess that's cool, cool. so there were actually that that conversation uh sparked a bunch of kind of similar questions um So speaking of that, have you ever found a male that shoots blanks? Uh, that was from the American one. Uh, and then Cascadian Grown asked, uh, can you ask him if they have ovaries? If you peel the female flower open, you can find the ovary with a pistol attached. But if it's missing, question mark. Hmm. I've never actually tried to peel back and, and look for an ovary, but I'll, I'll definitely try that out. And then Paul Westapulo asks, how can you maintain vigor in an inbred line? Um, the thing about that is that if you, um, a lot of times there's going to be compromising anytime when you're breeding something uh, for specifics. So sometimes people compromise vigor to be able to achieve some other end. Um, the way to avoid that is by having a big enough selection of plants that you are never putting a plant that lacks vigor into the program. Um, you know, people say generally like there's inbreeding depression, like, okay, things just get smaller and smaller and smaller and you just less and less vigorous. But I mean, you know, great Danes are inbred. That doesn't mean that Great Danes don't have issues. Uh, that doesn't mean that Clydesdale horses um, or, you know, these giant uh, Danish horses, they don't have issues. They might have other issues because whoever was breeding wasn't taking that into account. So you have to be able to take every different thing into account. And um, sometimes what people, are not taking into account is vigor. So you just always have to be able to select a plant that has everything you want and is still vigorous. And then um, you'll avoid having that form of inbreeding depression where you lack vigor. You, you might get different, um, different takes on it where instead of, instead of lacking vigor, you, lack THC or you lack terps or you know like a lot of people back in the day they bred for something that was all the way purple but to breed for what was purple instead of taking the purple potent one maybe they didn't have one that was purple and potent so they just compromised and they used the one that was purple and not potent and then you wind up with quite a few strains that are purple and not potent but you can have purple potent weed or you can have um, you can have whatever, whatever you want, but you can't select away from it and inspect to, expect to have it. So you can't breed a plant that has no vigor and then wonder why you have progeny with no vigor. You know, you, you, the further you inbreed, the more the plants that come out of that plant are going to be like it to the point when they're all exactly like it. And then at that point, you hope that the way you selected was for um, something that you like because you're, cause it's, it's uh, you get to a point where it's, um, it's all you have is that one thing. So the, the main thing is to make sure that 
as you go along, you always select for everything you want and you don't take compromises because you lack, um, you lack the right amount of plants that fit um, the description of what you were really shooting for, you know? Obviously, whoever bred Great Danes didn't at one point go, ah, well, this one's only as big as a lab, but it's got a nice coat, and then do that one or two more times, and pretty soon you'd be like, well, what happened to those big-ass dogs you used to have? Now they're little. But somebody might have bred that line for something that they didn't, they weren't able to see at the stage when they bred it. So sometimes that's why you have dogs that have, it's more likely to have dogs that have late um, life stage problems than early life stage problems because the early ones show up before you breed, but you could breed a dog and then everybody gets the puppies. And then later on you discover, oh, wow, look, but when it got old, it got unhealthy. So that's those traits you miss. And that's what happens with, with breeding weed is that somebody gets too, too much tunnel vision looking at what kind of terps they want. And then they pick the terpiest one, but it's smaller. And I mean, I did that with grape soda skunk. Grape soda skunk could be bigger than it is now, but I was so set on the terps and I couldn't find a big plant with those type of terps. And it might not be my fault. Those, those genes might be linked and so they might pass together that when you get this smell, it's always on a shorter plant. And there might not be any way to break that up without outcrossing and getting a new assortment um, of genes so that they can realign. And even then, they might still be too linked for you to be able to break those links. But, um, um, but that's an example of something that I did where I... I possibly, it's possibly inbreeding depression. It's possibly just the way the genes are linked together. But um, had I had a big plant that smelled just like grape soda skunk, I could have made a bigger grape soda skunk. But at this point, it's a pretty small plant. And, and they're all small like that because it's like F8. Um, so that's, um, that's pretty much, you know, the, um, the couple things you have to, you have to think about when you are trying to avoid that. So it seems like the, the first couple of generations, the, the F1s, 2s, 3s, you really want to look for the cannabinoid and the terp first, and then really make sure you focus on the vigor once you get towards inbred lines, just to make sure you don't have little runts and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's easier to change anything when you're in your earliest stages. So ideally, you want to be able to make the selection you really want from the hybrid right out of the F1. But you can't always do that because of the way some things, you kind of hope there's some co-dominance there. Um, but sometimes things are fully recessive and you won't be able to get them to F2. But when you're leaving F2, you really want to have the whole thing really where you want it. And then when you get to F3, you'll really be doing well. Um, if you leave F2 and you're not quite where you want it, you might be able to make a better pairing in the F3 because stuff's still around. Um, and sometimes that's why if you have limited stuff, even though it's kind of kooky, sometimes it's better to use multiple males at those early stages still. It's not really ideal if you're really trying to run to the finish line of where you're trying to get, but it might save you from needing to go way back, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, ideally, the earlier you can lock down things and get rid of what you don't want, the better. And the further along you get, the more of an impossibility it'll become, you know? Cool. <clears throat> so a while ago, um, Steve Raisner, Potent Ponix asked, uh, how often has he seen viral issues like mosaic or others in genetic stock? I've never seen mosaic. I have not actually ever seen even a confirmed test in cannabis. I saw one years ago and it seemed like it was a false positive and didn't really pan out. That might be wrong, but that was what I made of the situation. Um, 
that's talking about TMV, um, mosaic um, technically can be a term used to describe a plant that has certain genes turned off, which makes it become a sport. Um, I was informed recently though, that they also call that a chimera in cannabis. Um, but as far as like diseases like that, I haven't seen any of them. I have friends who are starting to test everything for hop latent virus, viroid, not virus, um, yeah. because it has been around a lot. Um, I haven't seen any symptoms of it on anything that I have. And, um, I, you know, I'd like to test everything just because I know that it's a, that it's a thing now, but it, it's one of those things that just kind of recently really came to my attention. I think most people don't know about it, but reading about what they are is really interesting because, um, these plant viroids are way gnarlier than viruses and they're a lot harder to get rid of, um, to the point where it seems almost impossible people have said you can keep your plants vigorous and grow past it um which is like a macro version of meristem tissue culture where you're just trying to grow instead of that tiny little tip you're trying to just get past it i don't know if that's possible or not um i haven't seen that confirmed scientifically and um it's definitely like uh the boogeyman at this point is that um is that uh, hops uh, latent viroid? It's really um, could be a scary thing. It's also interesting because you don't necessarily see symptoms of it when it's around, and that's why they call it latent. But um, I, I um, myself, I've never seen a confirmed case of anything besides, um, you know various fungal infections and uh and um insects and of course whatever kind of regular pests but i've never seen anything on that on that level um confirmed myself so this is a another... totally totally random question but do humans get viroids or do we just get viruses anyone know i believe like are there you... example of viroid like I think there is one viroid, which is like hepatitis D or something like that. Um, and I think that that's the only identified human viroid. Um, somebody can look that up though. And uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, exactly. Right. We, we, we are definitely an unqualified panel on that topic, but that just popped into <laughs> my head. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that 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 what I said is 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 uh, at least, you know, three quarters true. <laughs> we'll and, take three quarters. <laughs> well, it's, truthy. The, it's truthy. I don't know if it's D or F or E or what <laughs> I just went past C because that's the commonly the commonly heard one. I, I, I feel like I read that the only one in humans was a form of hepatitis. That's what I remember from reading about it, but I, I can't say for sure. Somebody can Google it real quick though. <laughs> I, I told Kevin McKernan to jump on and he emailed me back saying that he's on a boat right now, but, uh, <laughs> awesome. Right, yes. um, so a, a couple things, um, Can you talk about like F1s and F2s? Cause, cause, uh, someone said F2s are where all the unicorns are at. And, uh, that is why most breeders only sell F1s. The ones who sell F2s are risking their career. Well, I mean, you can analyze that really, really easy. The, the logic breaks down there pretty quick because if it's a huge risk to sell F2s, then it's just as big of a risk to sell F1s because someone can take your F1s and make the F2s pretty easy, right? So the logic there would be that you would only sell, to back that same statement, you would only sell F3 or F4 to avoid the F2s, right? So you can get past the F2s and then people don't get the variety. 
as somebody who wants just um, genetics, if I want to possess genetics from a certain gene pool, um, F1s and F2s are um, of more value in certain ways. Um, I feel like if you're a breeder, um, pure lines, um, like heirlooms and then the F1s of them and the F2s of them are probably a little bit more useful if you want to do something novel. And um, F3, F4, F5 and on are more useful if you're trying to, um, if you're trying to have predictability and, and a little bit less novelty. So like, say I want to make, um, I want to make, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know, name two strains, you want to make um, big bud cookies or whatever, you know, if you get the F1, you're going to have a bunch of a bunch of plants that will probably be big ass cookie buds. The F2, you're going to get some plants that are little tiny cookie plants with big bud weed on them, you're going to get big giant big bud plants with cookie weed on them and you're gonna get these different variety, different variation going from there. Now in the F2, depending on how people pair those things up going forward, now if you take, if in the F1 you have this plant that has a giant big bud plant with killer cookies weed on it, but it's giant cookies weed. And now you seed that with the male that you think is gonna be similar. You get your F2, you'll still get some variation, but you'll get a decent amount of, um, of that same thing that you had in the F1. Now at the F2, it's important to select the same thing you liked again out of the F1 and it'll be less frequent. So then you take those and you put them together. Now, if you continue that process into like F4, then you're going to wind up with these things where that's what it is. You always get this giant cookie bud on a giant big bud plant and it's all cookies and it's maybe what was the most desirable outcome you could have had from that cross. But if um, somebody isn't a breeder and they get those F1s and then they make the F2s and all they want to do is grow them to produce, they're going to be bummed out when they get some three foot tall mute looking plants that grow like cookies and then get undesirable big bud weed on it that nobody wants to buy, you know? So then those are less valuable for the producer, but to the, to the um, person who wants to breed in that F2, you might have something that is way bigger than, um, way bigger than what, what you would have got originally and um, a, a shuffling of the genetics where, okay, now, whoa, we just went bigger than Big Bud and we just went more resinous than cookies. And that would be the unicorn that you're talking about. We and went to 11. <laughs> yeah, you just went to 11. And when you go to 11, that's, that's, what's, that's what's called transgressive segregation. And that's when you get something that comes from the past that's, that, that's not really from the past. It's like from, the, it's, it's, it's like from another dimension almost. You're like, where the hell did this come from? Whereas you, sometimes you would get a throwback and that would explain why you got such a cool thing, but that's not the, that's not the case, you know, um, in this, what, in what we're talking about when you go to 11, because just something from the past wouldn't explain why the present just outdid all past generations. That's when you, that's when you've jumped, you know, um, to a new level and those, and those plants are what you will find. You will find those in the F2 and the F3 um, way more likely than you would find them later on if somebody hadn't selected those in the F2 and F3. So um, I, I don't know. I think that kind of answers what that was. And uh, when are you going to release the Big Bud Cookies line? Um, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have that one. <laughs> Uh, all right. So something someone asked of like literally in the first 30 minutes of the conversation that I've been saving, uh, until kind of near the end. Um, this was six, one, nine to six, six, four asked, could you ask Jackson if there are any seeds he has popped from Mandelbrot that he was gifted in the past? 
I this year am growing my first my first royals. Um, and they're not from Mandelbrot. I have seeds from Mandelbrot. Um, but he told me when he gave them to me that they might not come up. So they're in the category with other stuff that I'm kind of afraid to gamble on. Um, he gave them to me a couple of years before he passed and I didn't get a chance while he was still around. And once he passed, I kind of got gun shy on him. Um, but right now I'm growing royals that are pure, that are bred to a different side. That's more of the straight Afghani Hindu Kush lineage that's inside of those. And this year I'm going to breed a bunch of stuff with that in the fall. And um, I'm going to see kind of uh, what, what comes out of those. And, uh, you know, they'll be really cool. I'll probably cross them kind of do roundabout stuff like uh, he would have done. Like I'll probably take that and put it on like a Bubba to reinforce that kind of Hindu side, maybe like sour dub, sour diesel, um, maybe some different like OG stuff. And I'd like to cross it with, with like my lime, um, like lime one and, um, and some, some different things, but probably more like the more kind of indica leaning, uh, you know, Afghanica broadleaf, gnarly stuff. Cause that's, that's what it is. It's not like the fruity Royal and it's not the diesel Royal. It's like the, um, it's kind of like what, what I call like Hindu Kush, which people know as like that Baba Kush type, you know? Um, so those will right now I, they're, they're like a foot tall and those are my first, um, first Mandelbrot seeds I've ever grown actually. And can, can you talk about him as a, a breeder and a person? Like what made him stand out? Uh, I just did a big, um, I just did a big segment with um, Danny from uh, GWS Smoke Break the other day. And they're going to put that out. Um, they're going to put that out soon. But just like to be brief, he was uh, one of those dudes who really like risked his ass when it was sketchy to breed and grew tons of plants and um only for the sake of his of his love for breeding and everything and he uh he could have just busted out scenes and made a lot of money but he spent a lot of money just to hunt through thousands of plants to find these ones that he considered to be unicorns and uh um you know first time i met him he gave me a whole bunch of seeds like i don't know uh, like a, a bunch like you know uh a gallon freezer bag full of packs or something, you know, like the first time I ever met him. Um, so I'll say like, he was a really generous dude. He was, uh, very intelligent and, um, you know, from, from what I know of him, he was just a, a really good dude and he was uh, really loved in the community up here. And, um, you know, he, he goes back, goes way back and was one of the, um, one of the uh, pioneers of what is kind of the modern, um, modern kind of NorCal breeding stuff. Um, you know, now a, lot, a ton of people make seeds, but and and sell seeds and everything. But when he was doing it, he was one of the very few, and uh, he's just a um, cool dude. And who are some kind of breeders that? you respect a lot and follow and kind of what makes them unique and special in your mind? Um, I really like um, Inspecta from uh, CSI. He's always just been uh, really, really, uh, uh, really nice to me. He's always offered me seeds when I went by his booth and, um, and uh, always, you know, offered to share anything he has and, um, and uh, he's very, like I said, he's very transparent. He's really good with documenting stuff that he does. Like me, I'll like try to get pictures and not get good pictures and like flake out on the picture stuff while I'm doing all the other work and have sticky hands or dirty hands and wind up with like, you know, not that great of, of keeping track of all of it in that way because I'm doing the other stuff, but he takes the time to really document everything and show you and you see what it is. I grow his stuff and it's always really uh, killer that I've got from him. 
Um, and uh, I just think he's a really good dude and a really solid dude. And he's super no drama and, uh, and uh, he's cool with everybody and he treats everybody really good. And, um, uh, and, and I, and I like, I like what he does. He's, you know, he does stuff that he likes and um, he uh, he's very focused and he's a real plant guy that's really interested in, in plants for the sake of plants. And it's not just like pageantry and cool guy shit with him, you know? Um, the other guy that uh, I kind of found out about through him is, um, is 707 Seed Bank, Shabad. And uh, he's just one of these dudes who kind of pushes the envelope and does really solid work and took a lot of time to do everything he did and a lot of people have used his stuff to make stuff and there's a couple companies based off of his stuff that are that are really solid too and um uh he's just very scientific and knowledgeable and um level-headed and the same you know the same deal as uh as inspecta um uh Source Genetics, OG Cushman. He's always been really cool to me. Hits me up when he comes through and brings by some killer. Pretty much like some of the only indoor that comes to mind that's really like the shit, you know, where it's actually that goo and it's 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 great. And he has re he has really unique tastes and breeds for what he likes, which is like tripped out fucking spacewalk weed and uh, doesn't follow any kind of trends and has really had a big influence kind of behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about but um but just has always been real cool to me and everything um um let's see i mean there's so many people man i mean Bodie's like the sweetest guy you'll ever meet does tons of work one of the few people who travels around the world and collects land races and then does stuff with them, preserves them, does all kinds of neat plant shit, unrelated to weed, um, collects lots of different seeds and plants and all that. Um, Mr. Bob from Crickets and Cicada and uh, Hannah Bolt, um, both really, um, really cool total plant people, put a lot into it, into other kinds of plants and um, you know, it's always hard to start naming people because you, you're guaranteed to not be able to name everybody. But um, Bamboo, super cool, worked with Coastal for a while. Um, geez. Um, There's tons it's like, of it's, it's like giving an Oscar uh, thank you speech. You're, it is. I mean, they're freaked no out way, that you're going no to miss someone. Be like, why didn't you mention me? No, people are interested to hear <laughs> like, yeah, people are interested to hear like, oh, well, who do you think is legit? And, you know, I mean, I, anybody who's anybody who's into plants for the sake of being into plants because they like them. And that's why that's why they play with plants like and they're not total dicks, you know, like. I, I, I'm going to say that um, I'm stoked that they're doing stuff and I'm interested in, in knowing what they think and what they're doing and what kind of plants they have. And, you know, I like plants. So like all those kind of people, I'm going to, um, you know, I, what happens is what, who comes to mind is usually like the last people that I was just like checking out their stuff or talking to or something. So I can say that there's probably, I just named maybe five or 10 people and there's probably another 50 or hundred that I should be naming. And, um, you know, like, uh, well, let's just, take, let, let's take you off the through. spot for a second. Brandon and Kyle, how about you guys? Um, <clears throat> as far as breeders go, you know, the gear that I ran from, my name is Earl on Instagram. All of his gear was, there was nothing that I, uh, that was in the hunt that I wouldn't run again. Um, there was some stuff in there that was amazing. Uh, the stuff from Capulator that I've run, the, the math and the, uh, the gas, those were both top, top notch. Um, though, and, uh, those were like some of the, some of my favorites that I had that I just completed in the, in the current Fina hunt 
that I did. I also kept uh, a couple phenos of the uh, lime one, lime one grape soda skunk. I kept two phenos of that. And then there's another uh, company. I think they're a small company. They're called blue underscore channel, B-L-U underscore channel on uh, IG. And they did a, a uh, Skywalker Appalachian uh, Thunderfuck and crossed into uh, Purple Gooey. And I'm not even sure what all the genetics, lineages and all that stuff is, but um, I found a couple phenos in there that were just, I mean, they, they were literally just dumping resin. Um, they tested really good for the terpene content. Um, I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of good stuff. The stuff, a lot of the stuff I got from second generation genetics was good. Uh, the velvet ropes, they all had really nice color and they had, that old school reminiscence, like the, like the goo that was really, that was around a lot in the early 2000s. It had that kind of flavor, those blueberries that were around back then. Um, one of the things that I did notice in this current pheno hunt is a lot of stuff is really similar, similar, like um, they all had this very, very, uh, similar terpene profile some of them were completely different obviously but uh, a lot of them had this kind of like sweet uh, like a sweet cheese doughy kind of like the cookies kind of like the miracle, miracle alien cookies a lot of the stuff had that kind of terpene profile um, and I was really expecting to see a lot of the uh, profiles that I used to see back when I first started growing in the early 2000s which was like, you know, hoping for some like bubble gums and like the train wreck smells, um, the, uh, the, uh, like the grapefruits. Um, and I didn't, and a lot of the stuff that I, like I said, was really similar. Um, so, you know, that, that was a lot of the stuff that I ended up uh, selecting, uh, to keep running, to continue. Um, I tried to take the things that were you know, furthest apart from each other, uh, as far as the profiles go, uh, as far as the flavors go. So that's kind of like, you know, those are a couple of people that, uh, that I liked running kind of my experience with the last few hunt that I did. Cool. Kyle. Um, yeah. So for the, the indoor stuff, um, the symbiotic's been, been awesome. Um, I'm running some TRH, some of the, uh, grape soda skunk crosses and, and they're just, they're coming out really good too. And um, for outdoors, I've been, uh, I, I get seeds from this guy, Land Race Genetics on IG, and he's got a lot of like Land Race and Heirloom stuff, some Balak. Um, and they've been treating me fantastic. You know, they love the outdoor weather here. Um, Rebel Grown has been pretty solid too. Um, you know, I'll try anything just about once. Um, I got some actually some Mandelbrot oil spill that I've been just waiting to crack into. I'm hoping I can pop some of those within the next month or two. But uh, I try not to get too many different things going at once. You know, you you get too much going on and you start losing stuff that you really would rather keep. So. Yeah, you know what? I got some seeds, too, that I'm really looking forward to pheno hunting from a, a friend of mine who has been breeding since the late 90s. And a lot of them are the uh, F2 blueberry crosses. Uh, there's some old, so there's some, uh, a lot of the stuff is also the San Diego, old San Diego varieties, like the, there's some P91 crosses, there's some bull rider crosses, um, there's uh, the F2 blueberry, um, there's some Romulan crosses, uh, so I'm really excited to dive into those too. I actually popped a couple just from my little home grow tent, so I have, you know, one or two, but I, I'd love to be able to plant more of those and hunt through those older varieties. I feel like all that's right. always the problem. You know, you got so many seeds in the collection, you want to just pop them all. I, I can't even count how many packs from random people I got sitting around that, you know, I, I'd love to find 20 acres and a big old crew to just pop them all at once and see how it goes. Yeah, well, that's what we're working on. We're working on building this, uh, this pretty large farm out here in Oklahoma. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to take, cause I, again, you know, just like you said, you, you, I get packs from people all the time for seeds and I'm like, I get it. I totally love getting seeds because that's like, 
there's potential there, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah. I never know what you're going to get. And it's so exciting to see. Um, and so being able to do a huge hunt, man, oh, I can't, I can't wait. It's going to be so exciting, especially to bring back some of these older varieties, you know, and kind of hunt through and it's, it's nostalgic, you know, to get, have the, you know, the bubble berries and, and the old blueberries, the Romulan, the super silver haze, all the stuff that like, you know, that we kind of, you know, made all of our, our, you know, that's, that was like the thing for our whole crew, you know, all these varieties were our bread and butter back then, you know. Hmm. Did our guy go for another beer or what? <laughs> what's that now I, I, I just got handed a fresh poo for my one-year-old so oh <laughs> that i gotta that, that i gotta throw on the trash that's not so, a beer uh, that's a strange brew there no uh, yeah that is uh she loves making fresh poo for me no <laughs> old poo only fresh poo but uh so uh, we're we're, f we're three hours and 40 minutes in we got like 350 people watching um Jeez. so let let we're on the home stretch <laughs> let's wrap it up uh so can you give us an, one of the things I would love for us to start doing more, um, kind of fundraisers and stuff. And, uh, like I know Josh and Nick are into that and you're into that. And, um, can, first, can you give us an update on, on what's going on with Duke and then, uh, I love the idea of kind of like the cannabis community coming together to be like, someone's in need. We're all coming together to help out. Fuck you, rest of the world. What are you doing? Uh, so on Duke, I don't have any, any real specifics on um, what's happening other than that um, everybody made him uh a lot of money so that he can have the best representation um for his case i'm not sure what the situation is with it at all i just um i just saw how many people wanted to do something to help him out so i tried to um tried to facilitate a little bit and i mean i think probably um doing the auctions did okay and then just just the straight go fund me i think um brought in a, a bunch so uh the last i knew was just that they were getting getting him a real hard hitting um attorney and that it was gonna cost some major cheese and that if we could make that happen then he had his best shot um i don't really know um i don't really know much else besides that so hopefully we'll get an update about that at some point and um you know when i if i have any any news on it i i'll i'll try to um put up a post so people know what's happening with it and thanks everybody that um that helped out with that because a bunch of people you know it, it was like a an avalanche of of support for him and um you know we i put up stuff little by little and i planned to do it for a long time and then it got to a point where it looked like okay well it looks like we're straight for now so um right at the tail end my ig started messing up all the comments on the on the stuff would would um be out of order for me and then for the other person it'd be out of order for them things weren't popping up when they were supposed to and it wasn't refreshing right so it was really hard to figure out who was the actual winners and what usually was a really streamlined thing that took no work all of a sudden turned into something that was taking hours to figure out and uh um that was basically at the hardest possible time for me so um luckily we were still able to figure it out and everything but that's where that's that's where it's at right now thank you for the update uh so kyle brandon uh jackson any any last words as i am smelling some fresh poo right next to me <laughs> any deep thoughts 
Yeah, I was just going to, uh, you know, let your listeners know that if they're interested, they can follow on IG at Brandon, And then there's a link to my company, Bokashi Earthworks, and the uh, company that I work for, Majestic Craft Cannabis, out here in Oklahoma. If you guys want to see, like, what's going on with the uh, green waste recycling, biofertilizers, the organic indoor cultivation facility that I'm running, it's all it's all there. So it's pretty cool if you guys want to check it out. And I... Uh, I try to do, you know, education for people and let, you know, people know about organic soils, uh, integrated pest management and all that stuff. So try to try to help out the community by giving out information for free. So um, try to give back in that way. So um, anybody can find me there. Well, Kyle, you're on mute. I said, I'll, uh, I'll jump on that one too. And I guess you guys can find me at uh, kvidge555 on IG or at, uh, 555 underscore genetics. Um, you know, that's where most of my seed stuff goes on. And most of Jackson's genetics are on that page that I grow. And, uh, you know, shout out to my work, the Garden Remedies team. They're killing it over there. And we'll get some Dr. Lyme and other crosses that I use Jackson stuff in. And, uh, you know, hopefully I hear from some of you guys. If you got any questions, feel free to reach out. All you mass holes, check out his weed. Get it. <laughs> Go Pats. <laughs> and, uh, one more thing. Go Cam Newton. Yeah. Tons of respect to Jackson. You know, one of the first places uh, I saw his genetics were in auctions, you know, and, and it takes a lot to put that much effort and time into making these genetics and then just releasing them for a good cause rather than just profit for your pocket, you know, so big ups to you, man. Thank you, dude. Yeah. And I, uh, I appreciate you too. I appreciate you uh, hooking me up with those seeds, man. And uh, you know, I'm going to keep doing my thing and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, come up with some cool stuff in the future. Nice, man. Hell yeah. Yeah, I saw the Limerilla and I was like, oh, well, if you liked that, then try some more Limers and see, see, you know, how it comes out. I'm sure it'll blend right in. Yeah, I'm stoked. I'm real happy with everything so far. So keep up the good work, man. I'm, uh, I'm out of here. Right on. I got to go pull tarps in two minutes or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you guys later. All right. Well, on that <laughs> note, I'm going to kill the live stream. Thanks to the 300 plus people who are still tuned in. Happy 4th of July for everybody in the U.S. and everybody elsewhere. Have a good weekend.